knew if one actually wanted to start down the path of uh, assessing uh, <coughs> SRM. This work is an outgrowth of work that I have done primarily with Rob Wood, more recently with Bill Rash, who's here, and also with Armand Newman, um, who is responsible for the development of the technology that I've talked about. However, uh, the presentation and the opinions are mine alone, don't hold the other people responsible. Cloud brightening um, has already been discussed in the talk we had earlier. Uh, John Layton's done a lot of work on this. Um, basically, the idea is relatively simple. If you go back to um, the red dots, not too good. But if you go back to the ideas that Toomey published in 1974, 1977, if you add cloud condensation nuclei to a cloud, all of the things being equal, the number of droplets you get will be smaller, therefore the surface to volume ratio will increase, therefore the scattering will increase, and the backscatter will increase, and the clouds will be brighter. However, life is never so simple. So there are some complications, a number of them have been mentioned here already. Um, Marine cloud brightening depends on aerosol number, composition, and size. It depends on the state of the ambient environment. It depends on feedback from a modified cloud to under layer dynamics. Lynn Russell mentioned some of this in her brief uh, reference to EPs. I wish Lynn would have spent more time on EPs, but oh well. Um, and again, in the late room at our uh, presentation that Jim gave. Phil Rash mentioned that the aerosol may enhance brightening along the plume, but suppress it in adjacent areas that comes from LES model simulations. And this whole issue of teleconnections from uh, the region in which you do the seeding and what happens subsequently to that have been explored in a number of papers, but the results are not the same in those papers. And uh, it's not clearly understood. So why don't we have a better handle on this problem? The uh, confusing diagram in the middle is, is the uh, handiwork of my colleague Rob Wood. The little notations on the side are my handiwork. And what I really want to draw your attention to is that there's a bunch, there's a cluster of processes right here in the middle. Down here are the sources of aerosol, and up here are the large-scale variables, the mean wind, the sea surface temperature, the state of the atmosphere that determine how this cloud system is going to react. And if you look at the notation on the side, you can see that these things down here, the nucleation of drops and the growth of those drops, is happening on the micron scale, 10 to the minus 6. The boundary layer dynamics themselves, this mess in here, is happening, let's say, on the scale of 10 to 100 meters. The depth of the boundary layer is 1,000 meters, so maybe we could say 10 to 1,000 meters. And then you have this large scale that is being set by sonotic motions on a scale of 1 to 1,000 kilometers. So clearly there's a huge range of scales. When we talk about what happens in the climate model, the climate model is basically capturing this up here, and almost all of this is not resolved by the model, and it's therefore parameterized in one way or another. So why an experimental program? Well, we need critical information on how these processes actually work. And I want to emphasize that this is not just a problem for marine cloud writing and uh, climate engineering. It is also a problem for the whole field of indirect aerosol effects, which is one of the large uncertainties in our understanding of the effect of aerosol on climate and hence on climate change over the last 100 years. And I'm looking forward to the rest of this century. So there's a fundamental set of fundamental physics that we need to understand, and that fundamental physics is relevant both to the entire issue of indirect aerosol effects as well as marine cloud brightening. We also need to test predictive models of aerosol injection and cloud response. If we're going to talk about climate engineering, and I know some people don't like the word engineering, they prefer intervention. I don't like the word intervention for reasons I can go into the well. The point is, is that if you're going to talk about doing this, you need to understand what you're doing, and the only way you can show you understand what you're doing is to have a predictive model. If you don't have a predictive model, you've got no business messing with the system. So we need to be able to have a predictive model, and experiments are the way we test those predictive models. Now, I also want to point out that what we're talking about here is somewhat of a paradigm shift in atmospheric sciences. 
Atmospheric sciences have been more or less aligned with astronomy. We sit back and we watch what comes by. What we're talking about doing is moving atmospheric science into something that looks more like traditional physics and chemistry, where we're doing controlled laboratory experiments, but the laboratory is outdoors. Because we can't replicate the scale of the experiments that we want to do in a building. Or any kind of building. Now, this is not completely un um, unprecedented because cloud seeding has been done for many years. And in some sense, what we're doing is cloud seeding. The key processes that we're interested in are illustrated here. Um, first of all, the generation of the perturbation, creation and injection of particles, dispersion of particles within the marine boundary layer. I want you to hang on to that image of this picture, but I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Cloud response then is the response to these aerosols being injected into the cloud and the growth. That results in some perturbation of this cloud system. That perturbation can then feed back into the dynamics. Now, I grabbed this picture in a hurry, and I don't want you to think that's what we're intending to have happen. A hole in the middle of the clouds. But if we don't do this well, we actually could produce a hole in the middle of the clouds. So, let's think about what we would actually do then to test these kinds of processes that I just laid out. And I put up a staged experiment here. So, stage zero is a modeling laboratory spray system, and we've already done that pretty much, and I'll, I'll briefly uh, discuss that. The next stage is to actually do a development of an external outdoor sprayer um, and, a, and fuel testing in a coastal environment. And that's really what I want to talk about today. It's the proposal that we have developed um, and are currently uh, looking for support. Stage two is a ship-based spray, and I will talk briefly about that. And stage three then is after you've shown you can do this, you now have to talk about what you can do this in a large regional uh, experiment where you would actually uh, develop a climate signal, and I'm not going to talk about that at all. <coughs> this comes out of a paper that David Keith and uh, a couple of other people here wrote. Uh, looking at some of these experiments, I changed the nomenclature to suit myself. I just want to point out that these two, what I'm calling stage one and two, um, are minimal risk experiments in terms of environmental concerns. We're talking about injecting salt particles, sea salt. Um, sea salt is everywhere over the ocean, so there's nothing fancy about that. Uh, we're talking about local brightening of the cloud, but not a detectable radiative of flux perturbation. In other words, the energy flow um, is going to be below what we can typically measure, less impact than the existing ship track. Um, if we go to the next stage, which again, is I'll, I'll largely not talk about, um, it becomes somewhat low, it's a low risk, but somewhat more risk because there's a detectable radio flux perturbation um, and there's possible regional climate perturbation. So now within stage one, there are multiple phases. So the first phase is the development of the spray system, the second one is to test that spray system dispersion, the third is to uh, test it in a coastal environment, and I'll talk more about each of these, and then finally test the effect of the particle injection into the boundary layer on the stratus clouds. So the technical development of a sprayer. What we're talking about is being able to spray something on the order of 10 to the 15th to 17th, 10 to the 17th particles per second per sprayer. That sounds like a lot, but remember that these are really tiny. All right, so the total mass we're talking about here is spraying uh, buckets of water, not uh, you know giant tankers of water. Um, the sprayer has to be energy efficient. Uh, the group that, of engineers that's working with Armand came up with a technique that was really good, made really modern dispersed aerosol. The only problem was we figured we probably needed our own megawatt nuclear power generator in order to follow the system, which seemed probably not useful. Um, so we want to get particles that are about 80 nanometers. For those of you who are atmospheric scientists and know something about this problem, you say, well, those are pretty small. And they are. What you want to do is, in a sense, oversee this cloud. You want to make droplets that are small enough and, and multiple enough that they're not going to precipitate out. If you generate some giant nuclei, they will suck up all the water and they will become drops and you will produce a hole in the cloud as opposed to producing a cloud that's brighter. So you need to produce lots of small particles. 
the technique which we have, uh, and I shouldn't say we because I have nothing to do with this other than consult with Arla. Uh, there's a group of what I call the geriatric engineers. They uh, live and work in Silicon Valley. They're all retired. They are extremely good at what they do, and they volunteer time. Uh, as Armand says, the only problem is when one of them says, I'm going to Hawaii for vacation for a month, there's nothing he can do. Because he's not paying any of them. So all of this has been pretty much volunteer labor. The technique which we're um, using is an annular flow model, and this is an example of it um, in a picture. Here's the schematic of it. And basically the idea is that you have a thin needle, a diameter of microns, you have a water sheet, that's going down the outside. You have air under pressure, about 20 bars, going through the middle of it. When the 20 bar pressure air comes out, it meets the one bar ambient pressure, you get a shock wave, and the shock wave blows the water apart, producing the drops that you plant. You can control the size of the drops by the ratio of gas to water. There's a bunch of other details, um, well, they're pretty important details, that I'm not going to talk about because I'm not an engineer and I don't want to be screwed up. Um, but it meets the low energy, it produces the particle size, um, and we're still refining some of the things that uh, it doesn't do as well as we would like. This is a picture of the nozzle in operation inside the lab room. Um, this over here is actually a, a, screen, a camera shot that I took off the screen of the particle size counter. The particle size counter is saying the particles are about 70 to 80 nanometers, which is exactly what we want. Um, I will tell you that if you, if the nozzle is here and you put your hand here, uh, sort of about there, you can feel the water. By the time you get it out here, you can't feel the water anymore. All the water has evaporated. Um, by the time you get here and you're left with salt crystals. So phase one is to take this nozzle and build an outdoor delivery system. The nozzle that we have to get to where we'd like to be probably requires us to have several hundred nozzles. And they have to be mounted in a system with some sort of fan to propel the particles up into the atmosphere. When you evaporate the water, there's a tendency to produce a little bit of negative buoyancy because you're cooling the air, so you have to shoot them up high enough to allow them to settle down and uh, sort of equilibrate in the atmosphere. I often get asked about don't we have to inject them into the base of the cloud, and the answer is no. You're injecting this in an area, in a place where clouds are already formed. Only God makes clouds, we don't make clouds. We're trying to modify the ones that are there. So all we need to do is get the particles in the upper craft. And so we need to stabilize them in the lower part of the boundary layer and let the atmosphere do the rest of the work. So what we're thinking about, and uh, this is only thinking about at the moment, is to use these kinds of devices, which you may have seen in places where they're trying to make snow. Um, and the cannon sort of looks like this. And so we would mount the nozzles around the cannon and use the fan um, to propel the aerosol particles into the atmosphere. How would we test this? Well, I searched around a little bit, and uh, this is the best idea that I have found. Uh, a colleague in atmospheric sciences has something called a Raman shifted ice safe aerosol lidar that resides in these two containers. It was originally built at NCAR and then shipped out here to Chico, California. For those who don't know where Chico is, it's in the Central Valley of California. Of California and the Central Valley is really black. So what we have is, this is a view basically from me standing right beside the liner. You've got this huge fetch where you can put the sprayer out here and someone in the middle of the field generate the aerosol and then scan the LiDAR through them. And that little picture I showed you a few slides back is actually a picture of aerosol in the boundary layer taking the polar system. So you're going to actually watch them disperse in two slash three dimensions, depending how you scan the LiDAR. That little thing up there is a mirror, so the LiDAR beam comes out and you can scan across. This is the nicest thing that I have found. Uh, for us to do the test. Now, I realize this is not a marine environment. Um, depending on how much money we have and how much people want to invest in this, we could take this and move it to the coast. Unfortunately, inside there is a bunch of really nice optics, and if you bounce them down the road for a couple hundred miles, you have to get an engineer to realign the whole thing again because it's no longer aligned in any way you'd like. So, a 
Assuming that we now understand that we can generate aerosol and that we understand their dispersion in the boundary layer, we can now test this in a coastal environment where we're actually dealing with a marine environment. Uh, if we could move the scanning liner system, we might be able to do both of these at the same time. But we'd like to find the location where the marine boundary layer is affected in overland and clouds come along with that. Why do we want to do that? Well, ship time is horribly expensive. And setting up a measurement downwind of the ship is horribly expensive. So if you can do some of this initial testing in a coastal environment where you can actually uh, base your things on land, it's a whole lot cheaper. So, uh, sorry you should say phase three, I just discovered a minute ago. Um, this is a place called Moss Landing, which is between Monterey down here and Santa Cruz up there uh, on Monterey Bay in the coast of California. And there are several reasons why um, I've identified this as a possible site. Uh, please don't go run down to Monterey and say I'm intending to spray salt all over the real estate because uh, none of that has actually been decided. It's just a logical place. Uh, I will point out that uh, it already has its own power plant. So um, it's not like this is a pristine environment. The place I would really like to do this is Point Reyes, for any of you who know California. That, however, is a national seashore. And all I would have to do is say, I want to spray salt particles around the national seashore. And you wouldn't want to hear the, uh, the comments we would get from doing that. Uh, but one of the reasons I like this area is it is relatively flat. It's an agricultural area. It's flat for about five miles going in, so the kind of thing you would see doing is putting the sprayer right here along the coast and putting a bunch of ground sites I just uh, scattered in there with instruments that would allow us to look at cloud and aerosol properties, and we would also have small aircraft sampling. Uh, again, the plane that Lynn mentioned in the heat piece, um, experiment is certainly a candidate for the kind of thing that we would like to do to measure aerosol and top properties. So this is just a schematic of what we're talking about. Um, what, oh, I should say, um, there's actually two pieces to this. The first is to do the aerosol without cloud present. The second is to do it with cloud present and look at the effect of the aerosol on the cloud. The phase four, assuming that there's uh, been a successful phase three test is similar to the E-piece experiment that Lynn showed with a controlled well-defined aerosol ejected into a marine boundary layer. It requires an extensive uh, set of measurements. You need a ship to carry at least one and possibly more of the sprayers. We want two aircraft, one in the cloud to measure the response of the cloud and one below the cloud to measure the aerosol and the aerosol is going into the cloud and possibly a research ship down the monitor boundary layer in the cloud. So this adds up to um, a non-trivial piece of change, the whole experiment does. One of the things, um, I've done a whole bunch of field programs along the way, and most of the time when I've done field programs, you go to the science agencies and you ask for amount of money and you get less than what you ask for. Um, and it's not that we ask for so much, so we ask what we think we need, and we often get cut. And then we have to go, well, what are we not going to do? And this is an experiment where I really feel that's not an acceptable approach. If we want to say we're doing this test to understand the processes, we need to measure the things that we need to measure, and we shouldn't be talked out of this for the sake of doing it. This is an experiment where we really need to have the ability to monitor what happens. And finally, there's open, this is the open ocean testing idea where you have a ship with a single plume. Here's a schematic that came out of the paper giant by John Latham. They've got multiple airplanes uh, flying either in the cloud or above the cloud, um, depending on what you want to do. So, there's a general schematic of what we're planning on doing. We would like to run models in a predictive mode as a regional forecast, and we'd like to evaluate those. And to some extent, I've made a, a fairly dramatic statement here, but I think in the interest, so from a physical process sense, we can go, okay, if we weren't successful, we can repeat the experiment and do it again, and that's what we often do. But if we're talking about doing this as a precursor to doing solar radiation management, by marine cloud writing, we need to have a predictive model. If our model does not predict what happens within some reasonable bounds, then we don't have an engineering model that's successful. Now, 
I wanted to introduce a little bit of reality here. Um, I, I, I often hear people talk about geoengineering as if this can just be done and it's right around the corner. Well, I want to point out that the corner is kind of far down the block. So if I look at this, um, we're talking about two to three years here, we're talking about another uh, year or two here, and by the time we get around to this in another year or two, we're 2021. And that assumes a couple of wonderful assumptions. And any of you who've been involved with field programs know that those two words often don't go together with any kind of field program, adequate and timely. Um, that we have sufficient confidence that the money is coming along so that we can do some of the development in parallel. We don't have to wait for the sprayer to get done before we start planning the next stage. And that the stakeholder involvement, which is totally necessary, which are, um, you know, we, we need to do, evolves in a timely way with no extended delays. Any of that is going to show that, so that what I want to point out is this is the optimal time frame. This is the best you're going to get. Let me say a few things about ethics and governance. Uh, I want to acknowledge the fact that I have learned a lot in the last 10 weeks. I am co-teaching a class at the University of Washington with Steve Gardner. Um, we have 12 graduate students and two postdocs. And uh, we are doing science and ethics together. And um, I've sort of jibbed up this little diagram to the way we think about the problem in the class and have been exploring it. Um, I know it's very simplified and we can talk a lot about that. Um, the observations which I'm going to present here are mine. This, one of my students is actually keeping track of uh, comments that Steve and I have made because she finds it amusing that we don't agree with each other and it shows up during our class discussions. So, just in terms of the framing of the marine cloud uh, brightening, I want to point out that stage one must cause detectable microphysical changes in the cloud. If they're not happening, then we're not doing the job. Stage two must cause a detectable climate signal. You can actually measure a cloud albedo change. These forcing perturbations, however, are associated with this to the boundary layer and the surface. In other words, the pushing on the cloud are very small. They are less than what are associated with typical ship tracks right now, and therefore we expect no detectable change to the local climate or ecosystem. So, in some sense, my ethical friends go, the knowledge gained about the climate system, the benefit of this experiment far outweighs any possible, uh, presumably negligible risk. So, go ahead and do it. So, the take home message is here MCD processes can be tested. There's a logical, hypothesis driven chain of experiments that we can follow. I want to emphasize that this is a dual purpose experiment. This is not just about marine cloud brightening, it is also about indirect aerosol parameterization. Experiments at this level pose a negligible environmental risk. It's dwarfed by lots of other things that are going on, and the ethical analysis suggests that these experiments are allowable. And the governance, um, as far as we're concerned, can be done within the existing structures for field programs in the United States. Let me end with a couple of statements about looking to the future. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we are past the point of wanting to wait to do these experiments. We are talking about a decade of experimentation before we would be ready. Now, Mike, it wasn't quite a decade, but remember, I was assuming everything is optimal. So if we started today, my best guess is that even if things went more or less well, it would be a decade before we would be ready to do a large-scale regional test and say, yes, we have something that we could actually do and to some extent predict uh, what's happening. If we move up to this next scale of the regional cloud modification, it raises some really new interesting issues of science, ethics, and governance. Um, and I, I've just listed a bunch of them. I don't want to go through them. I do want to point out that I think this is a discussion that needs to start now. I don't think what we're doing at the moment, what we're proposing to do, should be held up because of this discussion. But I think we really need to start this discussion so that five years down the road we have a better idea of how this ought to work. Um, one of the things that I have learned in my conversation with the ethicists is that scientists are really good at problem solving. So we like to bore down and we like to find the problem that we can solve and we like to solve it and we like to eliminate the stuff that didn't matter. Ethicists turn this around, and when you pose a problem, they back way up so they can see the grand vision and try and solve all problems with the grand vision. And the governance guys are the 
was saying. So we have to have a meeting here in the middle of the road, and that's why we need to start the discussion. And last, uh, SRM development month in my mind was not be started without a credible program from CDR. Doing so is a serious ethical lapse. Thank you. Two questions, I'm trying to keep them short. Well, the chairman would have been here to start. You know, the... <laughs> that, that is a true statement, and uh, I was allowing myself to get right. Uh, this doesn't have any history time, but, but I nevertheless, I was important on what we started. So, the timekeeping goes ahead, whoever does it. Hi, Tom. Do you think your pristine environment is pristine enough? Um, so I worry about this in the coastal environment particularly. And so the way we thought about doing this is actually borrowing stuff from Doug McMartin and Steve, uh, Stephen about modulating the sprayer and so being able to look at the effects of the sprayer and the spray technology down the wind. Um, I think it does present some problems in less than clean environments and whether you're going to get the response of the cloud you want. And so some of the actual responses have to take place, have to wait until you actually can get out to sea. But I think there's a lot of this testing you really need to do ahead of time, and I, and I just can't see doing it with a ship. That's why I'd like to do it at Point Reyes where it would really be clean, but. How sensitive are you to the particle size distribution? Because the, there are all sorts of ways of creating particles that I used to run on labs and some of these things. And what you're describing at the moment is, is perhaps not quite safe the art. Well, there is, um, I can refer you to a publication in which my colleagues discuss about eight different techniques which they have tried. And a big part of the problem is trying to get it down to the small particles. To the yeah, it's, it's all about the narrower the size distribution. The narrower the size. One question for a customer. <laughs> well, I would like to talk more with you about that. Um, yeah. And I can't promise to give you the answer because I'm not that good of an engineer. I'm not an engineer at all. Hello, sir. Uh, I'm Pradhan from IIT Delhi. Uh, uh, Pradhan from IIT Delhi. So, my question to you is uh, that you said that we should start now. Uh, to deploy techniques because it is a multi year process. So, my question to you is whether we should first make our models perfect and then deploy these solar navigation management techniques, or whether we should deploy the solar navigation management techniques and make our models perfect based on our observations in real life. I don't feel comfortable with saying that anybody should deploy a solar radiation management technique who does not understand what the consequences are. So I think we need to do a practical stepwise development of examining what we're doing and predicting what we're doing and saying yes, we understand this. One of my fears, if you think about the future of this, um, so there's a slippery slope argument, which is, you know, you shouldn't start this because somebody might use it. Well, the slippery slope is already slipped. The ideas are out there. And so it's very possible that 10 years down the road, so let's suppose we don't go to research. Ten years down the road, somebody decides they want to do this, and they just go out and do it. And so then the question is, what are the consequences to that? And I would rather have a careful experimentation as to what happens. I am actually an agnostic on whether this is going to work. I, I had a very funny comment when I was in Berlin, and I talked to somebody there, and I said, um, you know, I am an agnostic. I have no idea if this will work. And the guy said, well, yeah, you're smart guys, you'll figure it out. Uh, well, the laws of physics sometimes <laughs> don't it doesn't matter how smart you are, you sometimes you just lose. So I, I think we do need to do the experimentation. And I don't think you can deploy things and then say, oh, gee, let's self correct them on the way. You've been so efficient answering questions, we could get one more short one. No? All right. I am happy to discuss this with anyone afterwards as well. Matt Watson, University of Bristol, uh, uh, expert in volcanology, and did that uh, dealing with the public on this topic. <laughs> 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 So, 
So if that's all well done, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'll try and keep this relatively brief if I can, because I'm quite like to field some questions. Um, this first slide is a, uh, is an aid no mark for me to remember, but I've uh, called this the various guys and lots of different things. Um, I, I call it the uh, skies of the limit, which we felt was far too optimistic. I called it screams from no man's land. That's my knowledge to uh, mark the man's uh, dispatches from the front lines because um, I'm working in geo engineering to see a flap from both sides rather than just one. And I'm certainly not on cold comfort um, because it reflects more sort of both personal views about the prospects of the planet and for geo engineering. And we're also making copies more comfortable. <laughs> um, so, so, Jim Hayward uh, told um, meeting Ross Society, no talk of geoengineering, we should start out some context. This is my one contextual slide. We've seen it a few times before, so I'm not going to go through it. But um, uh, uh, this is the, my personal driver for working on this stuff. I think it's clear to me that I'm not a, uh, a, a huge fan of. Geoengineering, but I think there's a there is a, uh, a point at which I think most people would have to agree with this sort of stuff. So I think it would be unethical not to act. Um, uh, and there are lots of reasons why I might not want to do uh, SRM, but actually there is a point at which not doing it comes to some cost. And uh, I think given that's the case, and doesn't look likely that that's going to change anytime soon, it will be kind of PCC. I think it's a whole lot to think about this. We have to think about it carefully, and we have to be honest with ourselves about what our motivations are. But I don't think we can just ignore this one anymore. So let me tell you a bit about Spice. I, I bet a lot of you have heard of it. Um, <laughs> it's a quiet project with very easy to manage. Um, <laughs> so it, it is an amazing thing. I, I, it, it finishes in about three weeks, and I'm, I'm going to get drunk. drunk. I'm going to for that. But, um, it's hard to imagine a group of more sort of disparate scientists and uh, engineers coming together. So it's a collaboration between people interested in volcanoes, uh, atmospheric science, land processes, engineering, modeling. And um, for that, I'm really grateful. We, we, we have a slight, slight gallows humor in this project, but I think we're, we are, we've become more than collaborators, actually, we're quite close friends and we respect each other's positions, which actually vary quite wildly uh, about uh, the prospects of you and you. But actually, it's been a really fun, if difficult ride. Um, it focuses on the you know, tumor, because that's, the, that's my area of expertise, it's not going to be the best in terms of climate preservation. And although it didn't start out that way, it has certainly gone to consider more than just science and engineering. <coughs> Uh, and one of the interesting things that I might like to point out is that we, we have a, a, a spectrum. This is true for uh, everybody in the Spice Project. But I would suggest that there's a spectrum of feelings about geoengineering as a whole and SIM as a whole, which broadly goes from social scientists to natural scientists to physical scientists to engineers. I'm not saying one end is negative and one end is positive, that's a far too uh, simple or statement. But actually, you can see that groups of people with different backgrounds and different, uh, different ways of processing information, if you like, actually feel rather differently. And although this sounds very woolly, uh, contrast with all the scientists and engineers and audience, most of you, actually it's rather an important point. Okay, how we instinctively feel about the stuff matters, because it does introduce biases into what we do and what we think. But we have to be careful about those. So, um, I always start with this uh, personal message when I'm bored of being accused of being a fan of geoengineering. Um, I, I too am, uh, uh, am an agnostic, and I would, I would add to Tom's point that um, there are very many people who would justify a position other than that because very few of us have done enough thinking to make up our mind. I think there's so much about our outlook that's unknown, it's actually rather difficult to convince you that anybody should be anything other than that. Secondly, Spice is a feasibility study. Some people from the BBC emailed me asking how cold I was going to make the planet generally. Um, they got a fairly short shrift. Um, no, no climate engineering was done. Um, we weren't seeking to try and change global temperatures. It's a feasibility study. And a feasibility study. 
Uh, just because you think research is a good idea, I passionately believe we need to think about the stuff that's being one thing to point is a good idea. Research, if it's pure and honest, which you can argue it never is, but if it is, it should be, and we should be willing to accept the fact that it makes the point less likely as well as more likely. Uh, we certainly uh, sought to, and I think did, stimulate public debate. We made the decision very early on that we weren't going to cover plaudits. That was quite a difficult decision for us to make, but we decided actually it was going to be a waltz and all approach. Uh, I'm very proud of that. And uh, a couple of talks that we Ian talked about earlier about transparency and openness, which is important. And I hope to convince you all, those of you that don't yet believe me, that actually we're quite a long way to talk to the public and to stakeholders. Uh, that project and we were as open as we could be. So, for example, this is by my own I think I'm the only person who's yet in anything on geoengineering that's run into the Sun newspaper. <laughs> Maybe that we will, but actually, I'm, I was quite happy. I'm not having a day this time, but I'm working So, what about the project? Well, the project was divided into three parts originally, and a fourth was added <coughs> retroactively, which I think is somewhat more, but better than not. Uh, so the first, which considers um, the chemistry and the physics of sweet candy particles that one might uh, inject opposite sulfate in the you know, So the sulfate is something we know something about, these other mineral aerosols we know nothing about, we're very different about in, 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 in the behavior of the stratosphere. Uh, some sort of engineering assessment and, and, and a look at particular technology, and then some limited or very directed view of potential impacts on the environment. And then on top of this, we had uh, this idea of responsible innovation, how the scientists um, honestly and openly start to develop these ideas and try and make it as inclusive and as positive as possible. And for that, we uh, co-opted Jack Stilgo's at the back, so any questions about any of the fun stuff that you asked him. Um, <laughs> So clear two modes is, 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 is a great, I mean, perfect natural experiment. This is a, my, my one slide, uh, anything like biology, I've taken the clear two mode up to the slide out uh, for all these. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm bored of seeing more, sorry. Um, so this is uh, uh, a series of observations. <coughs> one of my own, uh, the, the hot colours are optically thick, parts of the atmosphere are blue colours are thin. What this shows us is that the uh, aerosol layer Certain navigated the globe and then spread holes over the course of the nine months. The final take on this is what might take over the last bottom right hand side is actually the aerosols going to be modules by the end of the uh, by the end of the process, and that's mostly down to uh, good luck. So it's most particularly able to talk about tree, but, but it was fairly close to the uh, ITCZ at the time of the eruption. So um, Unlike Jim's nightmare scenario of hemispheric projection, this actually was a, a, a global projection of aerosol. No, uh, SO2, which can just aerosol. We had about 20 megatons of SO2 produced in about six hours. This has a fairly deleterious effect, so I've borrowed this uh, slide from um, Alan Bogok. I just got a hell of a component of that from the interruptions. This is Alan Chong, uh, Adam, and Tubo. We do see a drop. Um, we're here to point out that it's not actually statistically significant, but there's certainly a suggestion that you see a drop in rainfall, particularly tropical rainfall. And there's some good reasons why that, that will be the case. So that's something we would have to be mindful of where we can inject. And the second thing, of course, is that we see um, uh, a, a drop in ozone. Uh, the methods of this, I think, are pretty well understood. As David pointed out earlier, they, they involve uh, a provision of a path to the surface upon which the reactions that might influence ozone um, may occur. Um, we'll talk all about one in particular that we've drilled down into. But from the graph on the right, it's obvious that the eruptions of 1991 and 1982 have these little spikes that drop in ozone. That's well known, but that's something also we want to worry about if we wanted to, if we wanted to inject. So, on to work package one. These guys are going to speak much more elegantly uh, uh, and completely about this this afternoon. I'm just going to do the taste of them. Work package one thought well, we, we know sulfur 
Suffolk has some deleterious effects. What, what might we look at instead of as a candidate path? And so we came to Cambridge, we drew up a list, and we went into the lab, and we had a look at some of these pathways in a very quite specific way. So, um, Andy's in the audience. Um, Andy and others were responsible for the, the uh, tracking of these particles, so he used a single particle and you pin it in a laser, and actually two lasers, and you hold it in place, and then with a rather laser, you probe the surface chemistry. It's uh, quite exciting, particularly for something to spend a lot of time in the field, to go over the lab, and not be incredibly clumsy, it shouldn't be allowed, it's just more than uh, expensive than that. When you get to your site, you can see these particles that are about microns to be trapped in three dimensional space. All of you can grow the chemistry. Uh, turns out that actually trapping things that aren't perfectly spherical, in essence, that aren't liquid, is rather difficult. So, spice, if you have it, then you want to come and figure out how to do that, start the project. So, that's something that I will be rounding down the throats of the funders, which is something that's not just useful for geoengineering, but also more generally. Um, we also conducted lots of experiments in um, the chemistry lab in Cambridge, of which this is one. This is a look at the uh, reactions of uh, N205 on the surface of our chemical particles. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail because people will know more about it going to talk later. I uh, will just make a rather amusing point, I think, that actually this is what a chemist thinks of that looks like when we take a photograph with it, like that. <laughs> Um, so, um, others will speak about the, that particular experiment this afternoon. It is worth uh, pointing out, though, that we did find some rather interesting things. And what I'm hoping is that these results will be picked up by people like uh, David in his model, which starts to think about the very specific uh, reaction kinetics for uh, ozone on uh, aerosols. In this case, titania. And we're looking particularly at the uptake of to this. Um, about N205 on the surface of the table. It turns out that reaction is about 100 times slower as a solid. Why is it important? Well, N205 acts as a sink, uh, a, a mopping agent for the stuff that might destroy ozone. So the, the modeling chemists at Cambridge then took these data and they ran a computer simulation <coughs> told us that if you look at uh, the observations of the clear tube that we see at uh, a reduction um, in 205 associated with the presence of uh, sulfate acting as a catalyst. If you do the same thing with the uh, titanium in the model, you don't get the same deleterious effect. One of is titanium isolation. Notwithstanding the fact that, as David points out, this is rather alarming uh, property of this particular material is incredibly photoreactive. Something that we are yet to explore that really needs to be done. So, in terms of the, the pumping mechanism, uh, one of the things that, that we figured out is actually uh, something pumping something up, something of the pipe. Uh, it's very, very difficult, it turns out it's going to freeze, some of this is not the pipe. So, we look at other, uh, other uh, propositions, including uh, uh, slurries of nitrogen and titanium, or other mineral aerosols. This is something that works that um, you described this afternoon. I don't think it quite did itself justice in terms of quite how complicated the models for balloon and tether are. I showed this um, slide to the research council, particularly those in the dirt. And I might not understand what mathematics means after, but um, they, were, they were understanding enough to appreciate that actually the way that tether and balloon are is exceptionally complicated. So this mathematics actually describes moving from a static to a dynamic uh, view of the tether. Okay? That's just one part of the system. So, Hugh's take on this slide is that, however, this stuff gets up into the stratosphere, where we didn't need to do it, which is that, is a major aerospace project to try and get up. There's no, I don't think it's any Thirdly, uh, Jim uh, pointed out rather well, nicely in the paper on the nature of climate change that um, if you were to hemispherically inject, uh, uh, air, uh, some of the aerosol being either uh, artificially or through volcanoes, <coughs> you actually have a rather profound effect on the other hemisphere. I didn't talk about this in great detail, but it turns out, I think it was relatively well known beforehand, we drag the ITCZ towards the normal pole, 
And in case of northern hemisphere injection, that would mean turning off rain from in the Sahel region, which is understandably terrifying. And here's that. Uh, in a spatial context, you can see that depending on which hemisphere you're injecting, you either dry out or wet. But it's very, very important region where other people with high vulnerability are trying to eke out existence. Similarly, Simon Driscoll's part of the CBIP uh, project proved that um, actually most of the struggle with the phenomenon that's observed after the year 2000 in the northern hemisphere. <coughs> so, this is the difference between observations and models, and what you can see is actually there are some pretty clear differences in the fact that the models don't capture this um, northern hemisphere that's warming after. Interruptions. This is something that um, Leslie and Simon and others have gone to fix by better describing the dynamics in the stratosphere that actually control this process. So, one of the take home messages from Spicer is the dynamical behavior of the uh, atmosphere is as important as any of the other things we've been considering. And actually, to date, haven't really been looked at in detail in the context of geology. Finally, we've got work on page four. Um, this paper might be um, one, one of my uh, favourite papers, um, not least because um, it, it's on a. I'm not sure what I'm oh, cool. <laughs> Maybe a policy wonk on a bad day, maybe that's a bit um, so, so, social scientist, volcanologist, engineer, writing a paper about Frankenstein, uh, one of the cross biology. Um, this is the spark project, or some of the spark project, really large. This is a collaboration between two people which would not have sat down and came together. I hope it's a useful paper. It's more a discussion paper than anything else, but actually, it really captures the ethos of spice about trying to get people together to talk. Um, we also worry a great deal in the uh, stage game about uh, governance and, and responsibility. And I think what we decided that externally there wasn't much governance in terms of trying to get out of the experiment. There's some. It's important to know this on vacuum, but actually, the funders felt that um, that wasn't enough. And actually, if you wanted to take the first tentative steps outside, there were some things they could do. So, where the stage work process that came in. Again, you could talk about this. There were things that we could do very easily, like make the balloon experiment safe and compliant. And there were things that actually, as scientists, were rather ill to do. They decided whether or not how well communicated it was, the community was better. Engage with people, which is something we did after the fact, we found quite difficult, but incredibly rewarding, and somehow mindful of the future. How would this technology be used? Where would the first capital experiment lead? Scientists, this is something anathema, but it's actually we're used to cross risks, not thinking about social scientists from downstream. Personally, I think some of those risks are a little bit blown, but before the project started, I would even learn the existence. So, so uh, this is a picture of astroturf. Uh, there is a verb to astroturf, which means to develop false grass roots. <laughs> if that's handy for that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, nonsense been written about spice. Uh, mass public protest, wasn't uh, uh, Us folding in the face of pressure from the greens, that's a total mischaracterization, a willful mischaracterization. Um, so let me tell you what we did do. We spent an awful lot of time trying to think about how to communicate what we're doing with the public. Okay? And we decided very early on, and I'm very, very proud of this decision, not to make our lives easy, not to solicit the audience, but rather to open the debate. And that meant going to uncomfortable places, talking to people that really didn't think we were doing the right thing. And we did that willingly. With our, with our arms outstretched. Um, the outcomes were variable, but certainly if our primary aim is to stimulate the data. It turns out the public answer asked very, very sensible questions. Uh, this is uh, boiling down the work that Nick Pidgey and others did. It's safe, how we test it, who we should control it, what that different the role. In essence, these are questions of governments. The public want to know. That we are behaving sensibly. 
scientists, particularly university scientists, have something like an eighty-four percent trust rating. I don't know what that means. Um, I don't think Germans have a lot of students. Just saying. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, they want to know what we're doing, what, and totally reasonable. So, I've got three slides to go. The first is that uh, this uh, is a level of governance. So, this is boiling down the work that Jack reported to the research council about spice. I think certainly I agree with all of them. More consultation definitely should have taken place in, in advance of the funding. The way the funding was awarded, I think, given the nature of the controversy that surrounds the UHA, is definitely a factor of optimal. Uh, we did not seek to hide anything that we did. We were very honest about the decisions we made and, and how painful some of those were. Um, this is a picture of Jack, I suspect, but um, Spice can be seen as applying this idea of uh, responsible innovation to a very specific meaning in social sciences. Uh, I think I agree with Spice not so much writing them, but following the rules as writing them. And, and we've been very honest about how difficult it has been, and I'm again, I'm proud of it. It's quite difficult to work in an interdisciplinary setting. Everybody says, oh, just let's, let's make it interdisciplinary. That way you know what it means. And certainly without realizing quite how challenging that can be at times. So I constantly, from the start, of the moment the lack of context and the lack of help we've had with dealing with social contexts until Jack's arrival. Uh, it is good for us to have to think about social scientists, so I can't believe I'm saying this. This is sort of. Some scientists are going to be described as the sort of Damascus Road time. Um, it has taken spice internally a long time just to learn to talk to each other, even between climate scientists and engineers, who are not hugely disparate actually learning each other's language and how we think and behave our cultural aspects have been very fruitful, rather difficult. And from a personal perspective, I always have a very difficult agnostic professionally. Somewhat skeptical personally, as a part of the world of the There are other ways of handling that, but that's what I choose to do. And finally, this is the idea of no mutual framing. So, if I wanted to, if I wanted to scare you, I go with EPC's blood red sky blue uh, picture. I think probably if I wanted to promote your journey, I would say it was natural enhancement, it's just like volcanoes or plastic trees. Um, and open heart surgery for the earth. Make it go in mind. I think you can spin it either way. Uh, this is my last slide. Here's my pitch. I agree with Tom, I agree with David. You have to be thinking about this stuff. Okay? Absolutely has to be on the table. If there's a smoking gun that proves it's nonsense, then let's find it and let's rule it out. So we don't generate a false hope. But actually, we need to do this and we need help. It can't just be done by scientists, it can't just be done by engineers. Everybody on the planet has a stake in this thing. Uh, okay, dog in the fight, kind of um, And it can't be done to your single mark of blood, so Everybody, if you want to, has an opinion, has the right to contribute to this today. Any questions? <laughs> History is written by the vectors, and why not uh, the history of the Spice product project always really be written into history is that uh, failure of scientists to stand up for the sake of experimentation in the face of irrational objections for uh, hysterical end of the green that, that, that may be how it's written, though, but that's not what happened. So, that it doesn't matter. Uh, well, maybe, but um, I think I'd rather. That in some sort of crushing victory where people with alternative viewpoints to what is taken into account. Can you?
Um, that maybe it's at the university. Um, when you say you're a local officer, um, that makes you think what piece of evidence would have to emerge to make you sort of abandon the position of a local and become a leader or a disbeliever or so great in dungeon. So, 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 I said to you that agnostic is the lazy and defensive. Um, I apologize that maybe it's one of the two of people who said that. But for me, you might have that's the case. Um, but, but I don't think I'm prepared to make up my mind until I know a little bit more about climate sensitivity, although I think that's not going in the way we want to be. And I know a lot more about what these experiments might do to our scope. So uh, uh, I would, uh, I think it's dangerous to not construct an argument in using an adequate counterfactual. So if you look at something George Morgan wrote about the Spice Project very early on, he said, this is nonsense. Uh, Sulfates cause droughts in the Sahel, uh, <coughs> tropospheric sites, and the Sahel's really, what the hell would we do? What we should have done is ignored the literature on uh, sulfur rich power stations on the eastern seaboard, gone to the PN2 literature, and then compared that to future scenarios and projections for the Sahara, which I died. Okay, so it always has to be about <coughs> what is or the greater good. Well, that's a very laughing thing to say. But I think that you have to look where we're going, and you have to look at the priority of climate change from the you have to use that to account for decision making. Thank you. Oliver next, and then maybe we can get the mic over to that person. Well, here. You know Oliver? Here? Yep. And then, and then Jack. I mean, you talked about um, uh, thinking like a social scientist. Uh, I was wondering, how long did you think that the social scientists on the spice team did things like natural scientists? And do you think that's a, a reasonable symmetry or is a fundamental asymmetry in that relationship? So I suspect you know the answer to the I don't think it is a fundamental asymmetry. I think part of the aims of this particular conference was to try and invite social scientists to a meeting that was mostly about science. Um, this might turn into a rant, but I apologize if that was a particular point to Jack. But I would suggest that social scientists are rather good at expecting the things of scientists not particularly good at applying those same rules themselves. So Jack, Richard Owen, and Phil Walter wrote a paper about the stage game process of responsible innovation. And they talk a lot about how we've been made to be reflexive, reflective, etc. etc. All of which I totally respect. But actually I think all the whole moment which I didn't do that paper was to look back over the process. There's one throwaway line about how it was a challenge. Probably adequately cover quite how different it was for us and for them, actually. So, what I would bear in mind is if you're going to inform yourselves on more guardians, then you're going to have to go ahead. Yep. Um, yeah, we had a discussion earlier, Matthew, and it was related to um, aluminium being put into the atmosphere. Um, latest findings have come across is that most people have mercury in the bodies, and one of the problems it causes is Alzheimer's disease and dementia, which is another one killer in the planet. Um, if we do deploy aluminium, which Dave was talking about, scientists who are having a um, conversation would say the aluminium in the body goes higher along with mercury, it causes the neurons. Can we get to a question? Yeah, so what, what research or does anybody here today know um, the aerosol that we increase the aluminium in our bodies by the dispersing of the aerosols? You know, what effect will that on the human brain will Alzheimer's disease increase? Okay. It's probably a third part of the investigation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there is a little research on the toxicity of uh, aluminum containing in the body, but as we discussed earlier, yeah. Before we go much further, and people have presented on this yesterday, it is absolutely behold on us to look at the health effects of anything we might we might consider to get. That's, that's without, without a shadow of a doubt. Back when the calculation suggests that if you if 
you're, you're on millions of tons of sail, you're putting a teaspoon of something like the size of food dish. On average. But nevertheless, even though that's a fairly small amount, it is vitally important to know that this stuff will come down. If it comes down, it has health effects. I don't think there's anybody in this room who would say that they absolutely have to be less than it. And actually, the record David has said that's the most likely choice. I'm not sure I said that, but... <laughs> <laughs> so you said the thing that worries you most is how it is. It wasn't applicable in the meeting. I'm in my ghost. I agree that if we're going to go any further with these things, you need very serious investigation of initial health risks. Illumina is, however, one of the most common physician speakers across. And you can go look up, then it turns out that there's a very large deposition of aluminum laden dusts, uh, aluminum oxide laden dusts on the Earth today from natural processes of weathering. And so, an obvious check is whether or not the amount we would add, if there was ever some too sharing, is large or small compared to the current natural flux of aluminum dust in the uh, so, well, well, whether that's, I know nothing about yeah, that, yeah, and, yeah. and I'd like to know, that, but, surely, but, can I, but surely that would apply to aluminum that was, I mean, aluminum is just an, an element, and the point is, that's there in the natural world, it's one of the most common in this crust. So if you're not changing the amount very much, it's hard to see you be changing the effect very much. Whatever is the story about right here, I don't know anything about. It's hard to see that changing something that's already there by a tiny amount has a big effect. But in any case, yes, it's yeah. worth looking at seriously. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think we're done for questions. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, let's resume at uh, 25 to 4, I think, for the final session. Thanks very much.
That's so wonderful, and they want to uh, go home. As you know. So, uh, if, yeah, please pack up your things and um, uh, make your way out, and then we'll be bring to you at, uh, at the round of the um, Matthew Watson, Matt Watson, it's only his mum who calls him Matthew. He's going to chair this session. Thanks, Are you sure it's 7.45 or 7.15? For dinner trips? Dinner trips? Remember the last time? Oh, oh, and it's just cheap. Okay, just cheap. Um, so, uh, this is the final session of the same day. Um, and we're talking about atmospheric effects. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Francis Pope from the University of Berkeley, who's going to be talking about uh, uh, something that we've touched on already a couple of times this idea of non sulfate aerosols, in particular the consequences for ozone. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invite for talking. Uh, not so much for doing it over the rugby match. Um, so, yeah, what, what will the implications be on stratospheric ozone if we do particle injection? And before I move on, I think there was an interesting point earlier that I, Julian Hunt, about this going to be a very perfect solution. And so there will be detrimental effects, and there will clearly be detrimental effects to uh, ozone. And so we have to, how bad does ozone have to get before? Before it outweighs the, uh, the, the probably worse effects of climate, so something for that very long to go on. But saying that, so the ozone holds something that stratospheric uh, scientists have been working on for a long time, and this is a very uh, famous pitch, the Antarctic ozone hole. And so, one thing we don't want to do, we're trying to solve this problem of climate change, or at least, uh, at least to solving global warming for a period of time is we don't want to try and exacerbate the existing one, namely the uh, ozone one. And the trouble with stratospheric injection of particles, as I think we all know now, is it provides an heterogeneous surface. It provides a surface in the stratosphere where some reactions can occur which don't occur unless you have this surface. Um, so, I think, so this is not to scale, this is my uh, particle. Um, and so one reaction we're going to be particularly worried about is the uptake of chlorine nitrate, ClNA2 and HCl onto this particle. Once they get onto this particle, they react and they release chlorine, Cl2 and nitric acid. The nitric acid tends to stay on the particle, but the chlorine is laid on, it will come off the particle, it's got high vapor pressure, it will come off. And once this comes off, once the sun hits the stratosphere, then we produce Cl, then we get into these nasty blocks. Catalytic cycles. So that's exactly what we don't want to have too much of these catalytic cycles to remove those. So bearing that in mind, and this is exactly what happens because of um, our previous uh, CFCs up there. So this is the historic records. This is a very famous data set. This is the Haley. This is uh, Joe Farman's data set, RIP. But what we can see is as we put CFCs up into the uh, stratosphere. You start to see this uh, chromatic carbon goes out into the pulse. This is the corresponding one in the northern hemisphere, average over a larger area. Um, and this is actually a recovery now. It's not actually very obvious if you look at the data, but it is beginning to recover. And the uh, current estimates suggest that by about 2060, that the ozone hole will have, uh, well, won't get old anymore, will be filled back in. And so we don't want to really, uh, we don't want to make this any worse. Okay, so moving on to the ideal particle, this idea of the ideal particle to come up before. So David Q talked about this a little bit, Matt talked about this a little bit. And so uh, nature gives us the, uh, the natural analog of volcanoes, and volcanoes put some lot of sulfate into the atmosphere. Um, it turns out that the sulfate is not optimal for scattering sunlight for two reasons. Firstly, it's got a relatively small refractive index, and uh, secondly, it's fairly small. Um, and so there's other particle types that we might consider, at least the ones, or at least some of the ones we've been considering, which are high refractive in the indices. So there's titania, alumina we heard about before, silica, silicon carbide we haven't heard about before, looks fairly favorable in many ways, and diamond we heard about before, and zinc oxide. So <laughs> natural volcanic aerosol is down here, so fairly big. Low refractive index. What this is, sorry, this is a, a figure of the bond LB that's calculation from my talk range in the audience. And essentially, the, 
the more we get into this sweet spot here, the more uh, reflective the aerosol is, and the more the more light you can get reflected back out of space, the less aerosol we need. And so, for example, we can have titania up here. So we can get of a certain size. This is engineered to be a certain size. And so we can engineer these things in the first place to have a hit this sweet spot. As David correctly pointed out, we have to worry about once we get this up here, even if we can get this up into the stratosphere in a certain size, then there's going to be natural coagulations A with itself and B with the background sulfate. And if we assume it coagulates with the background sulfate and SO2 and sulfate condensers upon it, what's going to happen is A, it's going to get bigger, so it's going to move out the sweet spot in that direction, and also the, the, the volume. Uh, the volume weight of refractive index is also going to go down. So at some point we are going to go back down here. We don't know how fast it is yet. That's something to play. So we've looked at all these particles, some more than others. We've looked at titania a lot, we've looked at silicon silica a lot, but we've done experiments on all these. Especially if you see Layla's poster in the hall, she goes into most of these particles. So the first thing to note about the chemistry, the ozone chemistry, is if the chemistry of these particles stay the same, then, then being putting something up there with a higher refractive index means we need less of it, and it means we can have a smaller surface area. The smaller surface area with the same chemistry means you get less chemistry. And so matching this figure earlier, but this is this is the surface area density after the zero. So this is the surface area density of sulfate aerosol, and this is to get the same effect. For an optimized size distribution of titanium, we can get a lot less uh, surface area density. So, if the chemistry is titanium and sulfuric acid were the same, you've already got a much uh, a good effect, then you'll have less chemistry. So, that's the first thing to know. Um, but the chemistry is not going to be the same, it's a different, it's a, it's a different particle. So, what we need to know is the mechanisms, what chemistry occurs. And after we know what chemistry occurs, we need to know how fast that chemistry is. So we need to know the essence of this. And for this, we need laboratory studies. So sulfate is reasonably well known, and a lot of work with this was done on the ozone hole back in the 80s, 90s. Um, another thing that's been going through my head today is we probably want to make sure if we're going to chuck up a lot of the stuff, if we're going to chuck up a lot of sulfate, we actually want to make sure our our mechanisms and our kinetics of the sulfate were as good as possible, so we might have to revisit some of the sulfate. But if we're going to look at different minerals, things like titanium, diamond, alumina, etc., then we really need to go into the lab and measure these things. You can't model, you can't model the sexual <coughs> reactions, you really need to go into the lab. So what we did was we identified three key reactions that we needed to know to give some sort of assessment of what the chemistry would be. So first of all, there's this denitrogen. Denitrification, so the uptake of N2O5 in the particle. There's the uptake of chlorine nitrate onto the particle, and then there's the direct decomposition of ozone onto the particle surface. And that's what later the later talks about. Are we going into this anymore in this talk? It turns out it's fairly low. I invite you to go see later the next time. Okay, so this this is how we measure the kinetics. I haven't got time to really go into all the ins and outs of it, so I've, I've much uh, much simplified it. So essentially what we do is we put some aerosols into a into a tube and then we put the gas of interest, in this case it's N2O5, and we put that down the sliding injection. The sliding injector is nice because it means we can vary the amount of time that the aerosol sees the, sees the uh, gas of the species. And by varying that time, reactions on work out the kinetics. So essentially how fast is the reaction between N2O5 and aerosols? So if they don't react, we won't see any difference between the different sliders. Turns out they do react. And so we had a very able postdoc called that named Jim in town who did a lot of this work. And so we put in the aerosols of a known size distribution into this, into this tube with, with a known surface area. And then we measure how fast it decays away. And so this line, so essentially we have the concentration of the gas of interest here, and we have the interaction time here, the white dots are without. The aerosol in there, so there's actually a reaction on the wall we have to take into account. And then the black square is what the reaction time is with the wall plus the aerosols. And it's that difference that gives us how fast the reaction is between the species of interest. And so we do that for different gases and we do it for different aerosol types, and that's how we get this. So, very, very brief introduction to that. 
Okay, and so the, uh, the conclusions from this, so, so we had three, three key reactions we wanted to look at. So first of all, there was this n sort of five uptake, the denitrification. And it turns out it's a lot slower on titanium. And uh, so, okay, so titanium is less reactive than sulfuric acid, about 100 times so. And then there's this chlorine nitrate reaction. And that one turns out that it's a bit faster on titanium. About 10 times faster or so on titanium compared to sulfuric acid. And then finally, there's the direct ozone decomposition. It turns out it's very slow. It's also very slow on solving. So we've got, just looking at titanium as an example, we've kind of got some things which are better seemingly compared to the base. In the two cases, we've got some things which are worse. And so what we have here is a model run done by Paul Telford. And this is looking at the, the the uptake of the denitrification, so how much n 5 is lost in the stratosphere where we inject. And under a Pinatubo situation, we essentially lose a lot of n 5 but with the equivalent amount of titanium to get the same radiation effect, we see we lose much less n 5 This is, these are the upper, up, 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 lower than the limit of CIO2. Okay. Um, and so more recent work by James Keeble has now put this all into the UN UCL and UKCA uh, nudge model. So by nudging the model means we essentially use the climatology uh, from a certain period. So this is looking directly after the Pinot Tumor eruption in 1991, so this is 92. So this is annual mean um, the 92. So again, this is the N205 results. We've seen we lose a lot by N205. This is from the titanium case. I'm not looking at the Pinot Tumor case because the results are still being so we can't compare directly. But what we see is we lose a lot of um, N205, and that's what we expect, because we pick up a great surface area to the transfer, so more, more material for this reaction to occur. So that's exactly what we expect. And if we look at the plots or the chlorine oxides, we see we get a lot more production of chlorine oxides. And remember, that's bad with respect to ozone, because that means we get greater catalytic excitement. And again, that's what we would expect with more surface area. We expect more plots to come. Uh, likewise, HCl goes down, and again, more surface area, HCl goes into this, and then chlorine nitrate, and that's kind of a bit of both worlds, or essentially in some places it goes down, in some places it goes down. And we think we understand what this is. And the heating process is between the chlorine oxide and the nitrogen oxide. I don't have time to go into the detail. So, what's the outcome of this? Remember, this is the titanium case, this is the titanium case to give us the same radiative effect as the tumor. So what's the mean loss of ozone? So this is altitude versus latitude. And what we see is over the poles, we lose quite a lot of ozone. So up to about 20% of ozone, this is the mean average. Okay. So significant losses. I can't say how this compares directly with the so because we have to do exactly the same, same uh, model runs, but just for the Pinatubo case, there is likely to be gross losses in the and if we look at this over time, so this is 91 January, this is uh, 92 January here. So the two of them are up to the about here. And what we see if we go forward in time, essentially you get big losses of ozone once you get the polar springs, firstly in the northern hemisphere in about March, and then in August in the southern hemisphere. So essentially the line comes back in the polar spring and sticks starts this uh, catalytic hemisphere. So you do get significant losses of ozone under titanium change in density. But I can't say for absolutely sure because the work's still in progress, but I think it's, it's fairly likely that we would expect to see greater ozone loss um, under the density of this whole thing. So that's, that's one set of work. So the other set of work we've done is, so the, the, the previous experiments with the flow tubes were looking at how what happens to the gas phase. So essentially putting these particles up into the atmosphere and what happens to the gas phase. But we also have to know what happens to the particle phase. So the chemistry on these particles change as well. And to do this, we need to, as Matt alluded to, we have to come up with a completely new experimental technique, um, which was uh, developed by Andy Ward at the Rutherford Labs or the Central Laser Facility. So optical trapping has been done before. This is essentially where you have two lasers being to be trapped a single particle inside. It's been done a lot before for uh, spherical objects and liquid objects. But for minerals, they're not liquid and they're not necessarily spherical. So Andy developed a nice new technique of counter propagating the traps. And so essentially, we've got these two lasers to hold a single particle 
trapped in a, a, a very defined space. And once we've got it in this very defined space, we can then probe it. So then we have this rather than probe coming in, which is a vibrational type of spectroscopy. And we can measure what's happening on the surface. So we can see if reactions come on, do they stick to the surface, do they change into something else? So it's, it's, uh, and this works very much very nicely by Rayla, as opposed to outside. And so we can see if the, if the surface changes. And that's important because if the surface changes, then the chemistry probably changes in the gas mass. And so this is just a close up of the trap. So this is a laser one can be done that way, laser one can be done that way, and you can see the particle trapped in the middle of this. That's about two micron particle trapped in there. And it's just a zoom in there, so you can see it's two micron particle, non spherical, and all those times. Okay, so some example results of this, we've had a, this has been very productive, we've got lots and lots of results like this. But we looked at the same reaction with this uh, N205 on the particle surface. So what, we know it takes, we know this reaction takes N205 out of the gas phase, but what's the action due to the surface? And so what we see is that you get nitro on the surface, and that's not such a big surprise, so we're looking at silica here. Again, we've done other species, and other particle species, so this is what Silicon, it only looks like it's got this characteristic kind of shoulder about 500 wavelengths or other wavelengths. And then as we put some N205 in there, we start seeing this nitrate peak here increase. You put more N205 in here, that goes up. So that wasn't so surprising. But what was nice is if we actually do this temporal experiment, and so this again is we put N205 in here. So this black so this is time versus the intensity of this nitrate. So what we see is initially black just means nothing's going on. The red region is we put in some N205, nothing's happening. But then when we turn up the RH, not very much, because there's not much RH in the atmosphere, but I think we've turned up to about 25%, and suddenly you see this reaction kicks in. Okay? And then we turn off the RH on, essentially make it dry again, reaction stops, and then we turn off the N205. So we see it repartitions the nitrate leads the particle. So that's kind of interesting um, to bear in mind, because again, this transfer is fairly, fairly dry. So what that's suggesting is the drier it is, the less light this reaction is going to happen. So that's one example of experiments we can do. Um, so something else we have to worry about, this comes back to the coagulation and the condensation side of the argument, is how does the surface modify? A, under natural circumstances, so if we have this thing that can be it can coagulate the back of the aerosol. Is the SO2 going to uh, condense onto it once it's gone for a couple of reactions? And so we have to worry about this. So if we have something like titania or nuclear or diamond, it's got a certain radiative property, it's got a certain chemical property. And we want to modify the surface. If the impression is not too big in the back of the envelope, calculations suggest it might not be too big, then the bulk radiated properties will probably remain the same, but you've got a layer of something else in it, sulfate is the natural. And so then you're going to have a blocking to this, or at least you end up with a chemistry much like sulfate. So we really need to know how much this happens. Something else which I think Peter Davis is going to talk about, so I don't want to steal this one too much, but you could also proactively put a surface around these particles, so you could try and uh, minimize the chemistry naturally. Um, okay, so the current work we're doing, this is at the Rutherford lab now. Again, so this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to look at how does this coagulation versus condensation affect the chemistry. So we put a mineral dust into the uh, particle, so the particle into the trap, and then air the condensed sulfuric acid onto the particle. So what we have here is um, we have again a silicon particle here and then we coagulate it with known size of sulfuric acid. And so what we see here is the sulfuric acid coming on here. So we can, uh, we can check the chemistry of a pure particle, we can then coagulate it and we can check the chemistry again. So that's the sort of experiments we're doing now. Or the other thing we can do is we can essentially do a gas phase condensation experiment. So this is putting a sulfuric acid or making sulfuric acid on the fly. So essentially we put SO2 Plus visible light in here, and again, you, you get a very thin coating of sulfur on the surface. So, again, now we can look at how the chemistry changes. We can also look at how the radiates the chemistry. So, now I hope this has given you a, a brief flavour of what we're able to do and what we have been doing. 
So to conclude, uh, I think laboratory, I think everyone thinks in the group that laboratory experiments are absolutely crucial. You, you can't model this in the first place. So you really need to know what the chemistry is going to happen before you put the um, There's an argument that sulfur should be done as well. We need to have the mechanisms. We develop new techniques. So this nice track of energies really is a, a new way and we've been able to actually have interest in the obviously of this atmospheric chemistry. It's also had lots of interest from the uh, medicinal chemistry people. We <coughs> put these results into global models, it's ongoing. Further studies are needed, there's been many more options we need to look at than what we have looked at. And uh, we've got our follow-up project at Brown until we get to do more. So with that, thank you for your time. Okay, next. Um, so we're going to have to quicken things up a little bit. I do apologise, but Hugh's let me know that uh, we need to be out of here by 5.30, so I'm going to take the hands that are up, that's David, then Phil, and then two at the back, and then we're, then we're going to move on. Uh, but if you can make a question brief, that would be really helpful. We will be brief and technical. It's great that you guys are trying to get this out. Fantastic. Uh, are you, have you already released your video release uh, data, like the gamma for chlorine nitrate plus HDL? That we're just trying to work in. The model runs once that sample. Okay. Yeah, that's that's when well, then so it's five stuff sample already. Okay. Well, okay. So, so what are the temperature dependencies? So, how, how cold did you do your experiments? That's a good question. So, the all of them were not cold enough. So that's one thing we have to do. So we have to try and get some transfer temperatures. For the gas phase stuff, we've looked at the literature and there's not a lot of variation in the temperature for these type of reactions, so we're not too worried that things will change too much. But yeah. yeah. for the particle phase experiments, we really need to go lower, especially for the sulfur acid if you make the phase changes. So um, one thing I should ask David as well, but I think I say both is both mineral dust and uh are often really good ice in the behind as well. Thought about that and what the implication would be for using these particles uh, and having them sediment in the atmosphere where they could be honest. So, I've certainly thought about that, I haven't done any great calculation of it. So, obviously, as they come back through the atmosphere, especially the upper atmosphere, which is still fairly pristine, think about the atmosphere as being polluted, but actually, the upper atmosphere is fairly pristine. So, that is a worry when we do get nice deviation of that. Once it gets back into the middle of the atmosphere, I don't think it's a bit worrying because the numbers are often much smaller than. Just the, the bulk of aerosol, then you want that. But yeah, I think that question is absolutely true. They don't feel sure. So, that's the most absolute. We also worry about it, and we don't know when we were just discussing that maybe we should look for food at the GL and have to take our last one series. And you just I'm um, sure. Do we need? Do we need to, to, to do the real world versions of these results, or the lab ones, seen as the definitive? Or, or, or will do in the real world show you results that are more reliable than the lab? Um, I mean, you would hope the chemistry wouldn't change, but then, I mean, this point about temperatures and things like that. So you have to make sure the labor laboratory should be good enough, and it's been proved to be good enough. For the other stuff. But you really have to make sure you've done the right problem in space. So I think the experiments at the moment are very interesting and very informative, but it's not quite as advice, but there is much more we need to do to so before we're absolutely sure that nothing else is here. Thank you, well, so some apologies have to move on. Um, So, so, uh, yeah. so next up is uh, Graham uh, Mann from the University of Leeds, and he's going to be talking about the uh, rates of forcing from the uh, 1991 period to world. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Can you, can you hear? Um, <coughs> yes, so. Um, I'll be presenting some experiments, model experiments we've been doing of um, 
the map of the Tumbo eruption um, with an interactive uh, stratospheric aerosol uh, model uh, in a composition of climate model. So this is part of the uh, UK chemistry and aerosol um, collaboration that you've, you've heard some modeling uh, results from uh, earlier in the last two days. Um, so I'll start um, with the diagram that um, Phil uh, Rush showed on the, the first day. So really when we're considering the, the evolution of the stratospheric aerosol, uh, we to consider um, the, the transport processes um, uh, and, and the, the microphysical processes going on in the stratosphere that are, that are, um, that are forming these, these aerosol particles and consider their, their life cycle and uh, with, with microphysical processes growing the particles, condensation and coagulation uh, and their subsequent evolution in the in the stratosphere is, is controlled then um, by my transport processes, by their growth uh, and removal uh, by sedimentation. So if, if we're to, to consider the, the range of effects um, from, a, from a large injection of, of, of SO2 from a volcanic eruption or by deliberate in, injection of SO2, then really um, because of radiative properties of, of the aerosol, uh, many of its other properties are strongly dependent on, on size distribution and the way that these particles are, are dispersed radionally um, and how they interact with the radiation is, is dependent on, on, on all these processes. So, um, yeah, after a major volcanic eruption, uh, it's, it's um, been observed that um, particles of, of much larger sizes than, than in uh, quiescent con conditions. So this is one of the uh, major uncertainties uh, regarding how effective um, the, an injection of SO2 would be um, because it affects both, both the lifetime of the particles in, in the atmosphere, how large they grow and how, how fast they sediment, but also how effectively uh, they interact with, with solar and terrestrial radiation. So, um, yeah, this, this uh, study by Phil uh, Rash in 2008 that found that uh, if they're pres prescribing uh, size distribution uh, for, for Pinatubo evolution and the aerosol, if we um, if, if, if for an SO2 injection um, in, in, in the stratosphere, if we, if we assume um, a size typical of quiescent conditions, um, then, then we really only require half as much as if, if the particles have evolved to a size uh, typical of Pinatubo. So this is <coughs> a big impact on, on how effective that injection of SO2 would, would be. So this is subsequently been shown then also in um, modeling studies here, showing a, a plot of how um, the aerosol burden increases for, for an injection of, of stratospheric sulfur. So here they're using a, an aer a global aerosol microphysics scheme to calculate how the size distribution would change globally as, as the injection amount is, is increased. So here we see um, the nonlinear uh, effect from increased sulfur injection um, just in terms of the aerosol burden, um, compared to if, if, if a, 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 a constant size distribution is, is assumed. So we see this um, because of the sedimentation, the removal of the particles is, is faster and, and the burden then, then tails off um, suboptimally. And um, when you calculate the forcing, you see an even stronger effect because of the combination. <laughs> Of, of that shorter lifetime and have the efficiency um, of, of the scattering. So, yeah, the, the, I'll now talk, talk about some experiments we've done uh, of, of the Pinatubo experiment in our, our model. And I thought, first of all, it's, um, it's worth considering this, the, the satellite, satellite uh, the range of, 
SO2 uh, amounts in, in the stratosphere that was, that was present after the eruption. So the satellite measurements indicate um, between about 14 and 23 terabytes of SO2 was, was present. So um, when models are simulating the, uh, the, the, the evolution of the aerosol um, interactively, then they tend to inject some, some uh, SO2 around this, around this range. Um, but if you actually look at the, the, the satellite measurements then of how much um, of that sulfur made it into the aerosol at peak loading, um, then you see actually, if you, if you translate this, accounting for the range in composition of the aerosol, so ranging from 59 to 77% um, weight, weight percentage sulfuric acid, the rest being water, then we, we find that um, only about half of that um, from the SO2 actually made it into, in, into the aerosol at peak, at peak loading a few months, a few months later. So our, in our experiments we, we investigated this um, with, with a range of uh, SO2 in, injections. So we injected 10 and 20 teragrams of SO2 into, into, the, into the atmosphere. So this is um, the mention part of this uh, UKCA collaboration between Leeds, Cambridge and Oxford and the UK Met Office. So we've developed, we've developed now a, an aerosol chemistry sub-model of the UK Met Office's unified model, which has been applied for a range of, of applications. And here we're using, there's a range of chemistry schemes uh, available in the model here. We're using uh, the stratospheric chemistry scheme, and it includes this, this aerosol microphysics scheme to represent the processes uh, I, was, I was talking about, the coagulation, the growth of the particles, um, so that the, the, the variations in size distribution that are introduced by that injection of SO2 then feed back onto the, the, the rates of sedimentation uh, and their interactions with the, the short wave and long wave radiation. Um, so, yeah, the, the, to mention also the UK Earth System model in, in development, um, we we'll use this UKCA uh, configuration with, with stratosphere, troposphere. Chemistry uh, and, and the aerosol adapted for for the stratosphere and tropospheric conditions. So this will be able to, to handle um, the, the, the the stratosphere troposphere chemistry aerosol dynamics um, interactions that are going on in, in the model. So here's just showing the evolution of, of the sulfur loadings from from these simulations. So um, the solid lines are. <coughs> are uh, from the 20 teragram, um, 20 teragram run. So here you see um, the 10, 10 teragrams of SO2 in red here is rapidly converted after the, um, after the eruption into, into sulfuric acid. And this green line is how much sulfuric acid um, is, in, is in the stratosphere, in, 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 in aerosol particles. So we see, um, and these, these, these uh, we're showing the, the HERS uh, measurements um, of, of, of sulfate aerosol, so the de derived aerosol burden here to compare against, against the model. And we can see that with the 20 teragram, we're, just, we're, we're getting way too much uh, uh, sulfur into the aerosol, whereas the 10, the 10 teragram injection is in, is in, is in, is in, good, in, is in good agreement with, this, with, with the evolution. So um, in these experiments, the, the aerosol was uh, uncoupled from, from the, the, the dynamics, but I'll go on to show um, some results from, from those follow-on experiments where, where we relatively couple and we quantify the dynamical uh, interactions that, that result from, from, from the aerosol heating. Uh, so yeah, this is showing the, the aerosol optical depth evolution from the two simulations, the 20 teragram and 10 teragram uh, run against uh, the stage um, aerosol optical depth. Um, Measurements uh, and they reached ABHRR, um, AOD. So here we can see that the model is, is really capturing uh, the, 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 the transport to, to the southern hemisphere, the timing of the, the initial transport to the southern hemisphere, uh, and then to, only later to the northern hemisphere when it's over, over predicting uh, in, in the tropics, even for this 10 teragram run. You can see that it's capturing to mid latitudes the, the, the transport <coughs> and the timing of the plume. In good agreement with the with, with, with the measurements. Um, so really, one one of the one of the 
the things we, we wanted to test in the model there was the evolution of the particle size distribution. So here I'm just showing how the, the model is evolving. These left two panels here, the top is showing uh, the profile of the, of the surface area density in the model uh, um, as, it, as it decays away. So this line is indicating the peak surface area density uh, in timing of the peak surface area um, in 15 to 20 north. And here I'm showing the, the effective radius evolution. So we see that the, the particle size goes uh, continue to be much, much larger up to 400 uh, nanometer uh, effective radius uh, much later than, than, than the peak in surface area. So these, uh, these, uh, this aerosol size distribution is evolving um, according to the, to the microphysical and transport processes in the model. So we can then compare against the, the measurements. Um, so we're, we're showing here in the colors um, this combined um, aerosol effective radius um, measure, um, derived from combination of SAGE-2 and clays satellite measurements. So, and, the, the, and the, the, the solid lines here are for the model. So, you can see we capture this uh, meridional gradient in effective radius here against the measurements uh, and, and the decay away in, in the tropics. And, and this, this, um, this, this gradient in effective radius is, is qualitatively captured uh, well in the, in, in the model. So, this has a big um, effect on, on, uh, on the radiative properties of the model, the, the size at which they, they grow to uh, affects how it's scattering properties, as, as Francis was also uh, mentioning. So this, this um, is an important thing to test. So we, we, we also went back to um, the, the, the detailed measurements from, from balloon uh, soundings from, from Laramie uh, in, in the US from Terry Deschler. Um, so here, from these, these measurements, the, the optical particle counter can, can, can measure the, 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 the concentration of the particles in different uh, size ranges. So we're capturing the subset of particles larger than 150 nanometers in red here, and 250 in orange. Uh, and as the, as the particles go up to the coarser particles here at 1 micron, uh, which are much more important for the radiative heating. So we can see here that before the, before the eruption, we're actually capturing uh, the, these uh, 150 nanometer particle profile really in good agreement with, with, with the measurements. This black line is really down to just a few, a few nanometers, and we're over predicting at the, at the top of the aerosol layer. Um, but, the, but, the, and then the, but the overall um, optically active part of the, the, the particles are, are well captured in the, in, in the model. And so we see here the perturbation uh, then in March 1992, and these these particles are much much enhanced compared to the background, and, and you can see the model's actually capturing uh, this this variation, this complex variation in size distribution in the, in the profile at this mid latitude uh, uh, location in, in, in good agreement with with the measurements. So it, it gives us a lot of confidence that the aerosol that the radiative effects that are, are being predicted with the, with the model are are, are consistent with. With what, how the how the aerosol actually evolved, evolved um, in, in, after the eruption. So now I talk, move on to, to talking about the dynamical uh, effects. So this is since since that paper was published last year. I'm just comparing the evolution of, of, of the stratospheric aerosol itself um, compared with simulations where we don't radiatively couple the aerosol. We don't have the radiative heating here in the tropics, which is uh, increasing the, the tropical upwelling. So here, uh, when we have the radiative coupling, this transport to the southern hemisphere is, is with latitudes is increased, and the peak um, A and D in the tropics is is reduced. And again, this is a, a pair then of 14 teragram uncoupled and coupled simulations. And we see that these these 14 teragram, which was the lower bound of the SO2 uh, measurements that. Um, that presented at the start is, is, is giving much too too high stratospheric aerosol uh, optical depth against the measurements. Whereas this 10 teragram run uh, was matching the amount of sulfate aerosol, amount of sulfur in the aerosol, but was, would be underestimating the SO2. But it's, it's, it's getting the aerosol properties in, in good agreement with the with, with the measurements. Um, uh, so this is uh, was interesting to us and surprising to us that. Um, we, we needed to inject less than 
the lower the lower amount detected in, in the SO2. But this so this is sort of further showing um, how the, the evolution of the aerosol changes. We find that this, this upwelling that occurs uh, after the eruption. So this is show, this is just showing the aerosol further. So the black is in the stratosphere and troposphere. We have tropospheric aerosol symmetry <coughs> as well, and the green is the stratospheric aerosol. So we see that the, the, the increased upwelling is lifting the aerosol to higher, higher, higher altitudes, where the lifetime in the stratosphere is longer. So this is uh, lengthening the the, 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 um, the decay time scale for for the for the, for the aerosol with with a, with a big impact on its on its its, its radiative effect. Um, so. We see then, uh, actually, with the, with the tentogram matches even even closely, even more closely, the, the evolution from from the measurements from the from the satellite measurements of the of the, the total burden. So, if we look at the the aerosol rate of heating here again, for now for the ten and fourteen tentogram coupled run against the, the anomaly uh, from from here interim through the period, we're, we're again matching uh, two two to three um, Kelvin heating. In, in the tropics, which is which is in, in, in quite good agreement with the measurements. Again, the, the 14 teragram is, is is giving too much radiative too much radiative heating, and this has been a difficult thing for the models to to capture with, with prescribed forcings. The <coughs> paper has already been mentioned from Simon Simon Driscoll. Here we're showing uh, the, the 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 envelope of the model uh, radiative heating here, and most of the models are much higher than the reanalysis, which is this which is this. Uh, uh, dashed uh, blue line here, blue and green line here. So the model is actually capturing the, the, the radiative heating uh, in, in the model in, in good agreement also with the, with the 10 teragram. So I'll just show um, also some of the, the responses then as, as that heating occurs. Uh, we see here uh, the, the ozone signal, here's the heating um, of, the, of, of the aerosol layer um, at 68 hectopascals. But here's um, the dynamic ozone loss that, that, that proceeds in, in the tropics, and then you get a later um, increased stratospheric water vapor signal occurring occurring in the model um, after but af after this this peak in, uh, in in the warming. So this is an interesting um, um, difference between the the, the dynamic ozone loss in, 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 in from, from from the ozone from the from the dynamical response in the in, in, in the water vapor, and so these are quite preliminary results. These couple of results, but we're able to um, also we've done a, a comparison of the, the, the water vapor signal, uh, brief comparison against what's what's coming out from from the halo, uh, shown in the halo, the record from the halo measurements. So we see the timing of this increase um, in in the in the mid stratosphere uh, here. That is, is captured uh, in, in the model with this the tape recorder signal of the, of the water vapor increase. So, comparing to the, the, the early measurements, finally I'll show the, the, the anomaly here from again from the 10 teragram run. So, this is the three ensemble uh, members we've done with where the eruption was initialized for the easterly QBO phase. Um, and we, we see that for a 10, we get the, the, the near global and tropical. Uh, top, tropical um, and perturbation to the to the to the top of the atmosphere, all sky, uh, great shortwave flux, in, in good agreement with the with the anomaly seen in uh, in, in, in the early data. Again, so we, we, we're also capturing that perturbation in the long wave. Um, we're also uh, in, in pretty good agreement. So we, we we're capturing um, the. This, we're able to, to isolate the signal and the contribution to that anomaly time series from from uh, from the Pinatubo eruption. So I'll just mention as part of uh, a new Spark initiative uh, on, to understand the stratospheric sulfur its role in climate. So there's this this SSIRC uh, initiative, and one, one part of that uh, is a, is a field a big field campaign, but um, but also uh, there's a, there's, there's um, initiatives to bring observations together to improve models that are predicting the stratospheric aerosol model. And one, one part part of, of that will be um, an initiative to intercompare the models through through Pinatubo, where we really try where each of the models runs um, 
an ensemble of, of simulations where they perturb parameters, uncertain parameters in the model, and try to quantify and attribute the contributions and the sources of uncertainty in these models to really get confidence intervals on the, on the predicted rates of forcing uh, that, 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 would, that, that resulted from that erosion. So, in summary, um, we've shown that Actually, and this is consistent with other models, um, which I haven't shown, but in the paper we, we explain uh, and, and point, point that out, so that the, this, this number of 20 teragrams, which matches for the TOMS uh, measurements, um, measured within the SO2, leads to an over-prediction in, in the models of, 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 the, of the aerosol, burn, and, and, and AOD. <coughs> so, uh, but the models, if, if appropriately calibrated, are able to to capture the, the complex variation in particle size that was observed and therefore capture uh, the radiative effects from the enhanced aerosol uh, with, with, with increased uh, realism and, and, and really really isolate the effects consistently with, with the variations in, in size distribution. So we'll be extending this analysis also to apply to the, to the El Chichon and, and Agog eruptions to, to, to assess whether the, the SO2 emissions for those eruptions, um, the best estimates that, from, from the literature to see whether there's a, a similar uh, issue for those other, other eruptions, as, as these interactive aerosol models will be providing radiative, calculated radiative forcing, fully, uh, fully confident that the emission of SO2 uh, rather than prescribing the, the, the rate of forcing. So, yeah, that's, that's and just a point to the, the this, uh, Poems study to quantify and attribute uncertainty in Pinatubo uh, forcings that's, that's, that's coming up. Okay, we have time for, for one quick question. Oh, I hope that we are really have to move on to this. So sorry about this. Can we have a few more, everyone? Don't listen. Um, I found that the other two barriers in the Arctic was uh, a building of plant erosion in some of the compared to the building of uh, harvest of wheat. And in winter, uh, it was uh, actually heating it in the Arctic degree. Um, but I didn't see anything in the few kind of trial at 60 degrees north. Yeah, we were, I guess we were evaluating the, we wanted to, to evaluate how well these interactive stratospheric aerosol, uh, how, how well we can represent the aerosol properties. Um, but yes, absolutely, then the stronger polar vortex uh, and, and all, the, all the implications that, that result, from, result from that. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important issue, but it's not one that we addressed in these, in these particular uh, simulations. Absolutely, that's something that... Very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so in the, in the interest of a timely exit, um, uh, we are going to move on to the, to the next talk. Um, we need to be out here by 5.30 for security to leave. So next up is uh, Peter Davidson. He's going to talk about the manufactured particles, which is a step beyond what uh, Francis was talking about earlier. Right, thank you. Can you hear me at the back? Um, this is a famous picture from the Apollo program of the Earth. It's a wonderful laugh trick. Uh, I got involved in this when I was supporting the Copenhagen talks and felt that we needed to uh, start doing some things differently. Um, I put this slide up because it really shows what Turner thought about um, stratospheric aerosols and the effect they have on the sunset. And we need to give a vote of thanks to Paul Crutzen. Excuse me, can we have a Paul Crutzen? Where did Paul Crutzen? Paul Crutzen. Paul Crutzen. Paul Crutzen. Paul Crutzen. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Can you hear me now? Right, I think we need to have a vote of thanks to Paul Crookston there, Laureate. Uh, 
sparking off um, some of the original interest in this work. Um, there may be a problem with plan A. This is an engineer's perspective. This is a very good article in Science of America a few uh, a year ago, showing really the share of world energy supply in percent. This is from 5%, although it's 5%. When a new technology comes in, just take, say, for the introduction of coal, it took about 60 years before it reached uh, about 50%. Ditto oil, ditto natural gas, and our renewables were about here. So unless things change very dramatically, um, this graph would suggest we're going to have a, a few problems. Um, now, a lot of you are not atmospheric scientists, and I'm going to probably make the mistake of, of falling between two stools. So most of you know about Hadley cells and the issues of converting uh, energy from the um, uh, equatorial regions up to the poles. And the reason you get these cells is that uh, otherwise the angular momentum around here uh, would lead to very, very high velocities of the poles. What, if you're not atmospheric scientists, people don't know about, is above the uh, stratosphere, you get this circulation driven by UV which drives the particles round, or whatever we want to inject around here. And that's really, from a chemical engineer's perspective, one of the reasons why volcanoes punching particles up into this area are more effective when they're punching particles up here rather than at high latitudes. Now, the stratosphere is quite a quiet place, so you can see. This is work that NASA did as a result of space shuttles re-entering uh, with too much fuel. So this is height in kilometers versus length scale of um, eddies. And you can see once we get above 10 kilometers, 35,000 feet, we start to increase the length scale rather dramatically. And the stratosphere gets to be quite a quiet place, but not that quiet. So this is a simulation um, for one of the windiest days last year, uh, this is a Japanese website, I'm definitely going to put the out of it. And you can see quite a difference in circulation. This is a North Polar vortex that's come down from the North Pole and sitting just below the UK. Uh, quite a big difference in the uh, uh, airstreams. And I just want to point this out because you've got quite big variations from month to month in what happens to the stratosphere. Right, uh, knee scattering. Now, some of you will know this much better than I do, but if you have very small particles, you get ready scattering. So, the electromagnetic wave coming along to a particle very here scatters light in all directions. Knee scattering has a similar effect. It's not knee scattering because the electromechanics of what happens around here is much more complicated. The smaller particles, you get more forward scattering. The bigger particles, sorry, the bigger particles you get more forward scattering, uh, and the ratio of forward to back scattering is rather important. Now there is a sweet spot for particle size, and we don't want to lose sight of that. So um, this diagram reports to show that if we have residence time on the vertical axis, and particle diameter on the x-axis, then if the particle diameter gets high, the particles settle quickly. If the particle diameter is small, we also get a small resonance time because the particles agglomerate quickly. And there is a sweet spot, God or Providence is created, with the longest time, which is, turns out to be somewhere between 0.1 and 1 microns uh, by nature in physics, and that turns out to be um, a year or two. And for a manufactured aerosol, we don't manufacture one, we want to be in that region, as it happens, for the sulfuric acid mists, uh, we're in about a half micron radius. I think it's worthwhile just reminding people that these big bulkhead exposures, and we need big ones to function in the stratosphere, um, happen fairly frequently on a 1,500 year basis. Pinatubo is here. These are millions of tons of sulfur uh, put up into the atmosphere. 
The inner two bow was relatively small compared with some of these things, which were deduced by ice sheet uh, measurements of sulfur. Uh, Francis has described some of the properties, and David as well, of what we need if we have a manufactured particle. Now, originally, I think, as David said, we were interested in reducing cost. Um, but as time has gone on in the last three or four years of this project, we've become at least as concerned to reduce risk. So you want a higher refractive index and a suitable particle size to get the scattering. We want to control these reactions. We want a low thermal absorption, low infrared absorption, to stop the heating in the upper atmosphere. And what we're interested in is designer coatings to prove both dispersion and, as has been pointed out, we're quite interested in the effect of precipitation and the drops there when the particles come down. Low cost, little toxicity, and sufficient supply of materials. And we want intermediate scale experiments possible, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Okay, various people have their pet particles. I want to say I have no interest directly in the change of balance industry now, although I was responsible for this, uh, R&D uh, for the second biggest GIO2 <coughs> on the planet. Um, if you look at the refractive index, some of these culprits have been mentioned before, but this is the Moa's harmless, and this is the reason why we haven't been very enthusiastic about diamond. So any kit that we push that we use diamond with, we've got to be a little bit careful about erosion. Uh, ditto silicon carbide, and ditto um, the uh, uh, aluminum chrome. One of the advantages of chain dioxide is that it's much less hard. And there are two forms of chain dioxide, rutile and aptase. Rutile has got a slightly higher refractive index, but it's considerably soft. And uh, the other thing I ought to say is mankind is intimately associated with chain dioxide. So all around you is chain dioxide and more paint. TiO2 is really there to scatter light. You probably brush your teeth this morning or all this evening, you'll have TiO2 in that. If you you'll put stuff on your skin, you'll have TiO2 on that. Um, there's a lot of it. So uh, it's six, seven, eight, and I always forget which most common element of the Earth's crust. And these are the rates of production. So we're now up to about five and a half million tons a year of stuff, um, and increasing very rapidly. And people say about new technologies, we have a lot of social sciences, uh, I'm afraid to say, saying, well, new technologies you can't possibly understand the cost. One of David's uh, points is the cost of these things looks relatively moderate. You can understand the cost of GI2 because we make an awful lot of it, and there's the actual cost over the last uh, 30 years. Um, now, France, this is a micrograph of actually UV scattering GI2. So this is 100 nanometers, 0.1 microns. So this stuff is a bit smaller than what we would use in the walls, and what indeed um, uh, simulations both at Oxford and in uh, northeast of England are showing me good. What you're seeing here is a crystal, crystallite, dense GiO2, <coughs> and you're uh, putting on a layer. And I'm a bit concerned that we've done, uh, I'm delighted we've done experiments, because uh, that's a world first, about um, what the effect on some of the few reactions on GiO2 would be. But there's probably about um, a thousand man centuries of R&D work that has been done on putting on different coatings. So if you want alumina, that's common in the industry. If you want silica, that's common in the industry. And the reason for that is, as David pointed out, there is a band gap here. So when highly active photons hit that, you generate holes. And they go through and in paint, they attack the uh, glue. So if we didn't have reasonable ways of managing that, all the paint on these walls would be coming off um, within, uh, probably these walls, but outside, would be coming off pretty quickly. 
The other thing we do is to put an organic surface on the geometry, because if you're interested in light scattering, you want single particles, you don't want agglomerates of particles. Um, and one of the things that came out of a discussion with Sandy Cox about four years ago is we have uh, uh, chemistry that we can do there. And I think the next stage, the project after Spice, ought to look very carefully at different forms of organic. So, if, for example, you want to disperse the IO2 in a folding bag. You have a different length of organic tail to if you want to put it into a crib. And potentially, we can do exactly the same thing um, uh, as far as the atmosphere. This is showing um, the, uh, radius, the radius of the particle versus backscattering. Um, I think this is um, tarp side calculations. Don's are fairly similar to that, showing that for the sulfate aerosol, you get far as backscattering. For the, um, sort of okay, us, I'm just putting these slides up and you're welcome to have copies of them. Um, you make the stuff by a chlorination reactor, um, uh, two ways of making it. You either take your TiO2 associated with R and those <coughs> metals, and ultimately you make titanium tetrachloride. You burn the titanium tetrachloride with oxygen in a thing that looks like a jet, uh, a jet engine combustor, and you magically make um, particles the right size. And the way you control in this reactor to get particles the right size, you can alternatively make it in kilns. These are rotary calciners. These are about 80 meters long, about three or four meters in diameter. And because people have operated these plants for the last 50 years, somebody mentioned the health uh, uh, angle. And I would say, look, we've got to do some checks on health. But in practice, some very large scale studies have been done on this stuff. Otherwise, you wouldn't be brushing our teeth with it. Um, and the, the people who worked in those plants saw about 100,000 to a million times the concentration of TiO2 that we would breathe in if we had to put enough TiO2 up to cope with a doubling of CO2 and keep the temperature the same. We probably don't do that. And as a result of US studies and studies uh, from Finland, the incidence of cancer in the lung, which is the main thing we're worried about in particular, was lower in that population <laughs> than the general population. So, yes, we need to do that formally, but the initial indications are not too bad. Um, that's the biggest GIO2 plant in the world. We plant it to Lyle. Uh, typically, you'll get the coast to transport material. Um, now, this is a slide I produced, which has been widely copied um, by one journal with the wind going in the wrong direction. And I put this up to show that about three or four, four years ago, we were thinking about 6,000 bar, and Chris's work has shown that's not practical. Uh, when I first mooted this idea um, back in 2009, um, the first thing I was interested in about the urine mechanism was could we get strong enough materials? And Chris Burgoyne um, did some science and said yes, um, and then more elaborate calculations show we can't operate at that kind of pressure. Um, one of the other things you need to worry about is dispersion. Once you've made these particles, and you do not want to underestimate this, to get pigmentary scattering, you've got to have individual particles. There's no good making these fine particles and having these clumps. Um, there's another thousand man years of work gone into that. You can put them in jet engines or you can put them into a disperser. Um, one of the things that's come out comparatively recently, now I've done this work, um, to show that if you look at agglomeration, if you look at actually spraying this out from an aircraft, from a balloon or whatever, you probably get too much agglomeration in the early stages of dispersion. And that's why I think I said to David, um, I'm very keen on his balloon um, uh, and this strata bruiser, and this is copied from Dykes, McKeith and so forth, published in uh, 2014. Uh, I think it's a super idea, cost not all that great, 
of, of digging down to a clue. Um, I think, as David said, we need to look fairly carefully at the agglomeration that might happen around there. And it may be that we want to charge the particles. Now, this is where mere engineers get involved. If you look at the ionosphere and the charges around there, it's very unclear to me um, as to what levers we should and shouldn't pull, um, but it needs to be considered. Um, this I just put up to show how our ideas progressed from these huge 300 meter balloons. Now, one of the things that again has come up, you might say for obvious website, sideways winds blow the thing over, and you have a minimum size of tether, which is because as you make the tether smaller, the sideways wind for a constant drag coefficient goes down linearly with diameter, but the tension you can stand goes down as the area, so the square of times. So for a given wind speed at the low altitudes, there's a minimum size of balloon. It turns out the level material that's far too large. Now if you put intermediate lifting devices on with a reasonable lift drag ratio, you can bring that size down a lot. If you then change the drag coefficient, you can bring it down some more. Now, these, this was work that was done and published in Chemical Engineer, and a relative object is published in the Royal Salt. Really to say, when you use planes, and I think, my view, having talked to a number of the major aircraft manufacturers, is the cost of using planes is perhaps a bit higher than what David is describing, but, but I think we're in the same general ballpark. Um, I think the cost of development of this we're talking about is lower than other people describe it. But again, as, as David says, it's not that much of this. The reason I put the pumping thoughts up is in some ways this is very trivial technology. I've been responsible, people, chemical engineers are responsible for making polyethylene in 10,000 atmospheres, they use pumps. But pumping slurries through this stock that are hard and crazy is not a good idea. Also, dispersing it in the air with hard and abrasive stuff has its own problems. Now, this was put up in 2011, and I think we're running a year or two behind. And you can take argument with all of this, um, and I think what David has described is not that different to what we're describing uh, on this side of the pond. Um, however, uh, I would very much agree with what the National Academy of Sciences said, because in truth, there's a lot of cloud variation. If you think about the atmosphere as a whole, you can get results. And this is some work that was done at the NPL uh, by Nigel Fox. And this shows if you change the rate of forcing, how long do you need? Uh, to check whether you've actually got uh, a statistically significant result that matches with your models. Uh, and that depends on how accurately you can measure the Earth's albedo. And one of the things I would advocate very strongly, because it's useful both for this work, but also for the <coughs> forecasting, um, is better measurements of the Earth's albedo. So to conclude, if you like forecasting the weather, depends on these things, perhaps not so much in chemistry. There's a lot of common science engineering to forecasting the weather to albedo modification. These are the things that are a bit different. You do need to do experiments in all cases. Adaptation overlaps a bit without reducing emissions reduces a bit to that. But how much are we actually spending on those things? Um, well, we're not very spending very much in this area. Uh, these are very much ballpark figures, but the area of those, and that says the policy makers have got something wrong and we need to address it. Okay, so I talk about this as a fund trunk. Insurance policy is when somebody gives you some money for something going wrong. We can't get money from anybody on this. If something goes wrong, I don't think God's going to turn up with it. Of cash. This is our parachute or fire truck. Uh, I very much agree with what Matt said. We hope not to use it, but it would be a bit um, cavalier not to have it around. And that's why I said on the moral hazard front, um, my, I've given this sort of talk now to about 2,000 people. 
when people see um, an engineer say <coughs> they want to do research with this, their first reaction is let's reduce CO2 emissions. Um, and their next reaction is for about 95% of economic respondents is um, they have to spend a bit of serious dollar money on sorting out the risk issues. And uh, last, I want to say thank you to all these people uh, because you have a mere chemical engineer dabbling in environmental science and all of other things. And I will conclude one statement. When I joined, when I started designing plant equipment, my boss said to me, Peter, if you design a reactor that would blow somebody up, I want your sums checked. And then he went on, if you use a computer to do that, that can blow somebody up, I want to set the team doing it that doesn't talk to you and your people. Now, I've got to know fairly well over the years a lot of economists. I sat in Whitehall and observed the economists in the middle of the banking crisis. Subsequent to that, I've got to know environmental scientists very well. And I'm afraid to say both communities lack that transparency. <coughs> but can improve. <laughs> Questions from Peter? Uh, David. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, quite a technical question, I suppose, but um, I just wondered what the, uh, the byproducts are of high temperature combustion of that uh, um, chlorinated titanium compound. Is that something that you would need to be concerned about as well? Uh, people have been concerned about that since DuPont developed the process in the 50s. Uh, incidentally, it took about 25 years to perfect that process. So one of the things we have to be careful about is if we use other pigmentary particles, it's going to take quite a long effort. Now, if you look at the process, what you're doing is generating chlorine, and then you're recycling the chlorine. So most of the products are actually recycled. In the sulfate process, which I didn't show, you have a disposal problem of iron sulfate. And what's done these days is to effectively make it to put on ground as a fertilizer because there are many parts of the world which have been a shortage of iron and a shortage of sulfate. So the environmental issues in the TI2 industry are many and varied. But relative to the environmental impact we're talking about here, uh, in my view, there are some trivial. One more question. Some of your models aren't as good as you think. 
Great. I think with that we'll move on to the final talk of the day and also of the conference. We have a pause of week. Erwin. And he's going to be talking about uh, section, which is important, attribution, which I think is extremely important, and primary. Hello? Yeah. Okay, um, good afternoon, good evening, even though. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about detection, attribution, and climate control, but from a purely technical perspective, uh, there are good limits. I'm going to pick up briefly on something that Duncan Cameron raised and other people have raised before, which is this we ought to be aware of the limits of our understanding, and I absolutely agree. Uh, but what I'm going to be trying to do is using our existing understanding. What limits do we already know, or can we kind of already like derive from what we already know? Because um, I think that's very really important. It can inform us about those, those broader issues. So purely technical. That's not to say these other issues aren't important. I'm just cutting them out. Okay, a nice simple test. So if you were to try to control the climate, I think first of all, first of all, you need to sort of be sure that you wanted to. And that would involve a set of moral projections. So first of all, you have to be sure that what you want to do would actually result in a negative rate of forcing. Um, I'm not an expert on that stuff, but you know, engineering is required, you've heard a bit about it. And we need to know more about the processes, you can say, involved in the stratosphere or aerosol. We're going from that rate of forcing to, say, a global mean temperature response, we know that's going to work. Relatively solid first principles, like from the Earth's energy mode. Trickier going from that global mean response to the climate response. This is analogous with the problem with climate change. We know the planet's going to warm, but what are the details? That requires the use of uncertain climate projections. If you want to know, like for adaptation, we need to know what the impact is going to be, the details, like how bad climate change would be, or to what extent would an SRM reduce those risks. We need to then look at climate impacts. And that requires a comprehensive multi-sectoral climate impacts assessment. It takes into account not just climate change, but a whole range of factors. And now you'll notice I've used different colors here. It's very subjective, very qualitative. Green is easy, yellow is moderately hard, red is hard. <laughs> so if you were to do this, right, we'd have to sort of go through this, you have to follow through the story in models to have a justification. Next, if you were to deploy to engineering, SRM, sorry. Uh, you then have the challenges of detecting and attributing those changes. So let's go through again. It's from SRM implementation to the rate of forcing. Again, not my error of expertise, but I get the impression that it's potentially relatively easy to have a satellite up there to notice that aerosol cloud, to observe some of its properties. We saw some results from the tube eruption. Just a minute ago. Um, going from that, then, from the rate of forcing to the global mean response, I think we can again look at climate change. And you can see that. Now, we have confident attribution of work with the waters in the 1950s, or I think it's 95% confident now. That's due to anthropogenic emissions. But that's a relatively significant warming with decades of observation. And we're now really sure, you know, that's quite hard, that's moderately hard. Getting that down to continental scales, getting that down to even smaller scales, doing that for precipitation, that's hard. Detecting that from existing climate change it is hard. And then going to climate impacts is harder still. You have all these other factors, these other local factors, and uh, complex systems in the case of ecosystems and so on. So if you were to deploy to engineering, you might be able to see that you put an aerosol cloud out there. But detecting an aerosol <laughs> global response, the regional response, and the climate impacts, be very, very hard. So you won't fully know just your observations of what you've done. So now, given all these difficulties, <coughs> If you were to try and do climate control, you have to somehow link these together. You project model projections that initially justify you pursuing climate control with these observations that are quite limited, what they can tell you. That seems potentially very, very, very difficult. However, you can make the problem a lot simpler if you only try to achieve a, a more mundane target. This is where I think it's important to understand what we mean by climate control. So I 
I refer to this, if we're trying to control only the global mean temperature, I refer to that as global mean climate control. And that's quite different from other kinds of climate control you can imagine. So here, let's skip to our next slide. Here we rely on those first principles of energy balance. Less sunlight in it is going to cool the planet. So we know we're going to cool the planet to reflect light. We've got to deal with this moderate internal variability of the global temperature, but that's okay. We've got systems to do that. In fact, so it's a little bit like a global thermostat. And it's not completely ridiculous to make that comparison because. In the same way that a thermostat can control the temperature of a room without knowing why that temperature has changed, without attributing its own effects on the temperature, it relies on that simple connection that if it raises the amount of hot water running through the heater, it's going to raise the temperature of the room. <laughs> Notice a uh, therm yeah, thermometer in a room will operate on a timescale of tens of minutes to hours. One for the climate will operate on this timescale of decades. <coughs> so there's a big difference, of course. Uh, one part is missing, and so I should, I should mention just briefly that Andy Jarvis and Doug Martin have demonstrated that this, this kind of simple approach would work uh, in an idealized test case, but there's good reasons to believe that that's perfectly robust. What's been missing so far, I think Andy Jarvis is starting to touch on this and others too, is that in the real world, if you want to do this simple global mean climate control, you also have to have some kind of aerosol type of control. Uh, that's not, the details of that not been worked out, but it's presumably doable. And now you may be thinking, you miss it. I'm missing one of the most important parts, or the most important parts, which is the so you know, regional climate change here, no climate impacts. However, we can kind of, in a sense, if we're going to pursue this global climate control, we have to acknowledge that this is a limited climate control. We have to acknowledge that. So, in the sense that we'd be controlling these impacts here, it would only be sort of, uh, not indirect, is not quite the right word, but We'd have to rely on model projections for the details of what we're doing to the planet. They wouldn't be directly controlled. So we'd have to hope, we'd have to trust our model projections that what, you know, keeping global mean temperatures steady or halting their, or slowing their rise would actually improve, would result in less climate impacts. We do exactly the same thing with climate change. We have to rely on climate models to predict the details so that we can then adapt to them. Uh, and of course, on the other side, we have the same problem that detecting and activating what we've done to the climate beyond the global mean temperature will be very difficult and it will take decades for even a partial validation of our model projections. Um, so I think this is my most important slide. Climate control is probably possible. I think we're going to demonstrate this, but it is very limited. It operates on the time scale of decades. We wouldn't fully know all the details. We'd have to trust our models to justify doing it. That's quite different from perhaps, maybe control is the wrong term here, but just to be clear, it's possible but limited. Um, what I do in the paper that this is sort of based upon or sort of derived from is I then sort of look at the next, the next level up, which is uh, you mentioned a number of papers about climate optimization where you could potentially control multiple aspects, you sort of fine tune the you know, climate outcomes. That is a substantially harder problem. And it kind of merges uh, some of the challenges of detection and attribution. What I try to do in the paper is merge the challenges of detection and attribution with um, these control, control approaches. Uh, and it's substantially difficult. It's not impossible, but it's much more difficult. Uh, but I don't really have time to get into that. But it's important to know that here, um, yeah, kind of often we're trying to do a certain pattern of climate rather than the global mean climate response. And instead, you're controlling patterns of radio forces. It's nice to say that if you're trying to get to this level of control, you're no longer talking about the thermostats. And that analogy is no good enough. You need to rely on climate model projections. Uh, so, conclusions uh, global mean climate control, which I've talked about, it would work in a sense because it relies on a simple theoretical connection between what you're doing to the planet, reflecting sunlight, and the consequences that the planet will cool. It's the same thing, we rely on the same thing for global warming. CO2 is going to absorb infrared radiation, it's going to warm the planet up. And importantly, neither detection nor attribution is required for you to exert that control. You really want to detect and attribute what you're doing, but that's a kind of a separate task. Uh, whereas I was saying for climate pattern control, which I've not gone into the details here, the connection between the forcing and the goal, this pattern of climate response, is not direct, it's not simple. 
So we need to rely on client models or, or some form of other approach. Uh, and so I think that detection attribution and cloud packet control face some similar problems. There's some parallels there. Um, so generally, it's hard to attribute the consequence of SRM. Models will be critical to assessing and justifying SRM and to knowing the plots, understanding what's happening even after you deploy. I uh, think critically, yeah, cloud control is limited and has an intrinsic time scale of decades. That's important to bear in mind if you were ever to do it. Um, cheekily, a little plug for the rest of the paper. Um, I'll leave that up. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> So, uh, questions for Pete, uh, Andrew, back. You can step up there. Just to the uh, Andrew, okay. Um, the, um, the concept that you can control something without having a model is pretty simple because you, you just you get control by if it's succeeding a certain value. You to control on, and if you reduce a certain value, then you turn it off, right? So that's not normal, but the problem with the climate system is that one of the key factors that you're trying to do, deal with is mitigating the risk of termination shock. And if you don't have a, a model for what you're doing, then you're massively building in risk, or potentially massively building in risk, that you're not modeling or aware of. So you're, you're, you're potentially but by using this control systems theory type approach, you're potentially building a landmine on your own legs. Um, so I, I think that's something that has to be considered when reflecting this approach, not just the controllability of it, but if this approach is disrupted by external forces, to what extent can society compensate for it? So this is effect effectively independent of the questions of control, it's just a question of if you're exerting a sufficient cooling on the planet, which might be judged beneficial on some grounds, if it were to fail, the risk of termination is something to worry about. But it's unknown. Crucially, this approach is unknown, whereas in, if you've got a much more model-based approach, then it, it's not unknown, because you, you, you take a more predictive approach and then prescribing a set of interventions, as opposed to just simply using the outputs of the system to determine what information you should use without an internal model. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I'll have to maybe speak to you afterwards to get the details on that. Um, so you know I'm going to ask this question, but uh, uh, and, and first of all, I agree, attribution is a really critical problem that needs a lot of attention. Um, I would take the view that we're not going, based on a lot of history of closing control loops, that we're not going to be successful in closing the control loop without some direct physical intuition on cause and effect. But I do think that you can do more than one degree of freedom with some direct physical intuition. Yeah. Um, just as, for example, Jim Bailey's uh, work on the asymmetric forcing so I, I think you can push part of the way into that uh, regional climate thing <coughs> good, sensible physics. That's a, that's a good point. I mean, I, I in trying to come up with thinking like this in the, the paper, I'm still preparing for some reason. Um, I tried to, I, I just went, I went past that to try to do what they're doing with the tech attribution, which is derive these fingerprints of different uh, force teams. I try to like, consider what would a control scheme look like that relied on those. So, you, I mean, for example, CO2 had a characteristic of warming at high latitudes. And you can imagine another thing like um, having a different fingerprint. I think, yes, you, you could do something that's more relying on the sort of first principles or, or second principles uh, beyond the energy budget. Look at some other things like you, know, you mentioned earlier when we were discussing, like the position of the XTZ of like Jim Hayward's uh, work, set by perhaps the hemispheric temperature gradient. So you could rely on certain kind of large scale um, So that, I mean, that's worth looking at. Yes, I, I agree. Um, I guess I was trying to, the approach I did took was trying to squish together detection attribution and the control schemes and look at it that way. So I didn't go into the details there. Uh, but I didn't present any details about detection attribution either. So, uh. <laughs> Um, I haven't seen anybody even 
mention on doing climate control or weather control. Say, for example, we covered a thousand square miles. How does that correlate to carbon offsetting? Is there a formula for that? The reason I ask that is because if you use aircraft, some aircraft produce 11,500 kilos of carbon dioxide, and I wonder whether even an aircraft could offset its own carbon footprint because the carbon is there for a few hundred years. Yeah. Is that possible? I think that it's, it's an interesting point. I think there's a, I think there are fundamental problems with trying to do that weighing up of a solar reflection, like the forcing for because you can't do the code between the forcing from CO2 and the forcing from reflecting sunlight. But I think there are inherent problems, kind of half what you're hinting at there. CO2 has a very long lifetime, has chemical effects. It, it doesn't go away. Because if you stop you, know, you, you stop your reflection, you stop injecting aerosols, the effect is over in a short period. Uh, so maybe so David and Doug have written some things, so would one of you like to respond to this? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very straightforward. Right, well, right, 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 just behind you, the microphone. Maybe let's start with that. It, it, it's extraordinarily straightforward. I mean, if you think of the uh, 100 million barrels a day of oil we're using, and if you think of the world airline fleet, um, you can work out what fraction of CO2. Um, that generates, and then look at um, how much your fleet of aircraft would get that way, what your jet of blue um, do. And, and I think I last looked at this, it was about one part in 24. We're still in that box of the flight. It's still a carbon gain. It, it is a carbon gain, but um, you know, all the analyses we doing, we are assuming that uh, there will be massive reductions in CO2 at some time in the future. And if you don't do that, then there's not much point in doing this at all. So you like to talk to the championship also in the future parliament. Yeah. 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 I like the diagram, and I think beginning to be clear about the difference between the short period of control you want for controlling how much reinforcing you have. Yeah. Not, not in response to climate, but just you, know, you want a 10 for what you, know, you can't keep forward on where it is. I think being to break that out is really useful. In the latter part, not, I think the whole picture is useful. I don't see something to do with it. that original EDS paper that uh, came out. Oh, no, no, I guess that. You know, did, to be clear, clearly said yeah, that you couldn't do regional control on yeah. that signal to noise curve. So, um, perhaps I should, I should make clear, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to claim any of this was, was new. What I'm trying to do with this work, the paper goes into some more detail, was to make sense of the two perspectives. Uh, I, I mean, I believe the work, and I think it's very important, like more of the control papers. But I also I try to like marry that with the ideas of protection and attribution. And they do marry, but it's that's all I'll do is I'm not trying to claim this is this is this novel or the but um, just trying to make it a little clearer perhaps the the cutting edge in a way is just a mature model on something. But we're trying to look at at, at the the unknown unknowns and stuff. Unknown unknowns and the unknown 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 universe is mature models basically the, the, the outlier models that look very unusual and how you take the protection. Okay, great. So I think I might just hand over to Hugh, bearing in mind that we're up against the clock. To say a few words about wrapping up. There are others I think that would submit to us. To say I'm just handing over to um, uh, Ken Gladier and Greg Pomerantz, who are going to have a few closing words. But while they're setting up, just a couple of remarks. Um, there was a protest march this afternoon, and my understanding is that the we went there to um, uh, to meet them, so they went off and had a tea. Um, and uh, they come back, they'll, they'll be outside as we leave, and the security men will be there. Best if we all go out to turn reasonably quickly and we go out together. And uh, uh, the plans for tomorrow, I'll be talking about the dinner tonight. Hi, I know we need to close up short, so I'll uh, be quick, so I'll keep this short. So I just asked to make up a few quick comments. And uh, so one of the things uh, I like about this part, uh, 
like about this meeting was, although there was certainly no shortage of people expressing opinions from the uh, stage, that there was an emphasis on facts and empirically verifiable facts and not so much focus on opinions. Unfortunately, many of these facts were facts about what climate models do or what other sorts of models do under different circumstances. And it would be really nice to do some more work to establish the relevance of these facts about what models do to what might happen in the real world. I think one of the things also that's emerging is that there's a near consensus now on the need for research in some of these areas of solar geoengineering. And it seems like the debate now is really over what should be the scope and, and, and scale of this research. And then furthermore, there seems to be a, a divide about the wisdom and uh, what sort of preconditions would have to exist before there was outdoor, uh, so the wisdom of outdoor experiments, the preconditions that would have to exist for those experiments to go on. And just to say one personal thing that, you know, I think I was more opposed the idea of outdoor experimentation about a lot of traditional governments more a couple of years ago. And now when I'm hearing more of these things about you know, sort of a handful of material in the stratosphere or water in spray or salt water, it just doesn't seem um, something to get totally worked up about. And that uh, you know, they're just subject to normal kind of governmental review process and consistent with environmental legislation that I don't see as a good reason. Into outdoor research. Uh, um, so I thought the other thing that was of interest here uh, is that, well, there's always this um, desire for multidisciplinary research, and we did see some, you know, let's say the health impacts of the aerosols that we could be considered multidisciplinary, or these uh, sort of ecosystem effects of, of uh, solar geoengineering is also aiming towards multidisciplinarity. And most of what we heard here was really disciplinary research and people, you know, basically doing the kinds of things that would fit within a single academic department. And sometimes there's so much emphasis on the need for multidisciplinary research that we tend to underestimate the, the importance of disciplinary research. And so, you know, I think if we see somebody, um, you know, talk about what, uh, you know, putting some surface surfactant on the ocean to make the ocean white. You know, I think for the ecologists in the room, they're saying, oh my God, what's this going to do to the ecosystem? But that doesn't mean that it's not useful to understand what are the basic physical limitations and prospects for doing this. And so I, I think that, that, that we need to recognize that disciplinary research is really important and valuable. And that sometimes encumbering disciplinary research with a lot of multidisciplinary so disciplinary at the outset can sort of impede progress. And it's sometimes good to just let a discipline do what it does and make little progress, understanding that eventually we make a full evaluation. You know, not what we need to be multidisciplinary, but also uh, you know, creating a wider set of stakeholders outside of academia. So with that, I'll turn it over to Wade. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm surprised to be out here. You asked me to say a few words, and I know we're all going to dinner, but I'm not here to talk about dinner. I'm here to talk about breakfast. And uh, I get the breakfast down there in the conversation in Berlin. It's connected to the first point, which is what do I do? We ask you, what do I do? Because I'm neither a scientist nor an engineer. Uh, there are only two of us, I think, from Washington here at this meeting, which is quite and I own a monopoly right now in Washington. It's called Advocacy for Geoengineering Research. Billions of dollars are spent in Washington, I think, on lobbying, trying to create programs. Geoengineering research has a very small voice. So I've been in the climate field for many decades, and one of the holes in the field is that in the policy community, there's nobody advocating for a research program or scientists out around the country. But day to day, trying to move the executive branch of the United States, the Congress, the stakeholders, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So that's a project I have, 
and it relates a bit to our breakfast. Uh, the second thing, uh, second project I have is uh, related to the chairmanship of the uh, Arctic Council, which changes hands in a moment. The United States takes over from Canada. And what's the relationship of that to what we're doing? I think I suggested in one of my comments, but let me be clear. This is a historic moment. And we're all here in a sense in a context we've never been here before. Nothing like this, nothing of this scale have uh, so the political systems of the world had to, conf had to confront. So it's a unique moment. Now, the U.S. takes over the chairmanship at a unique moment in the Arctic. My term is unraveling. If you look at Greenland, the Canadian Alaskan glaciers, the permafrost, the snow extent, and sea ice, they're all headed south, so to speak. So here we are, U.S., what do we do with that? And at least our government has said, we are going to focus on the climate change in the Arctic, and we're going to communicate what's going on. That has been a decision. Now, why is that related to what we're up to? Because if you look at the drivers in the political community for wanting to know if we have any answers, if we have any tools, and what the risks are, you need the really two big drivers. One may be the Arctic. In fact, the National Academy of Sciences report on research needs in the Arctic clearly stated that the geoengineering issue could emerge out of the Arctic, and we needed to have answers. So I think this is going to be a two-year chairmanship. The end of it comes the first big climate meeting of the next president of the United States in early 2017. And I think that's actually potentially a big moment because if the signals from the Arctic continue to decline as they are, it only gets bigger. Diversity in politics, my, this is a comment I wanted to make about the meeting. I know it's marvelous, just a marvelous meeting. And I think what you managed to do was have so many diverse voices about this topic from all angles. And you kind of weaved in the politics. And that was very rich because the politics are such an integral part of this. Transparency, the debate, last night's panel. This is not just an issue for the wonderful engineers and scientists who are here, but for, you know, I have hundreds of colleagues in the climate field who know nothing about this. They are all advocates. They have to learn. They are participants. And if you want to go up on Capitol Hill and talk about this, the knowledge level is even, well, you wouldn't be overly impressed. But the National Academy report, I think, was a big step forward. And what was most important about it was its statement that we needed a research program. Now the question is whether we can stand up a research program in the U.S. government. And the, most of the problem is not that John Holdren, our science advisor, thinks it ought to be done. It's a political problem. Two fears. The NGO community, the sort of pol uh, political correctness problem, which is changing. And the other is the global negotiation framework. Because U.S., as I was a former negotiator on climate change for the U.S., we can't stand up a program as we head into Paris. Because if it's a big public event, I think the politics of it don't work for the administration because others will just say we're trying to sabotage and say, even though we're not. So, but there is this, you've got to manage the political problem. I think it's all, this meeting is a real contribution to legitimizing and taking the whole question out of the realm of uh, political incorrectness. And, uh, you know, when I go back to Washington, I kind of take this meeting with me and it gives me a much better voice in saying, we really have to do this. And you kind of feel much more comfortable with it, and it's much more legitimate. Now, back to the lobby and the conversation in Berlin. This is, as, when you're not a scientist or an engineer, you come to this meeting and you say, well, what do I have there? Can I actually raise the issues that are over my mouth? And you kind of get, it's hard to believe, but there's a certain reluctance. So, the wonderful thing that happened in Berlin, you know, when you come to a meeting, you're alone, you get any companionship, or I'm going to eat breakfast alone. So I sit down at breakfast at a great meeting in Berlin, and Ken comes along, he sits down, and who comes along, I've never met, he sits down, and we start having this wonderful conversation first about what Ken would say in his opening speech. But then with Hugh, uh, I think we did this two or three times, at one point he said, he started to complain very loudly. <laughs> very loudly. He said, there aren't enough engineers here. We have no voice. 
You know, we, we are really important to this, and we need to be heard. I'm now, you know, embellishing just a little bit. So here's where my lobbying skill comes in, I say. Hugh, you can bring the world to Cambridge. He said, I agree. So here we are. Thank you. I have another job to thank all of them and thank you, all the wonderful people who put this together. The venue, the logistics, the communications, the warm reception, I thank you. It's really been marvelous. So I am told, I am here to declare the conference closed. Thank you.